Bom, uh, boa tarde a todos. Estão me ouvindo? Ok, então vou apresentar o professor Federico em inglês e a gente vai dar início ao segundo dia de conferências, ok? So, our first speaker of today is Professor Federico Lick, with, uh, who will talk about uh, foundations of no Cogomoravian... Probability sorry. theory. Theory of probability. <laughs> probability theory, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Federico is a fellow of uh, Conicetti and uh, La Plata National University, and his main areas of research are quantum information theory and quantum logics. So, thank you for coming, Professor. Thanks to you. First of all, I wish to thank the organizers of this conference uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. I think that this conference is very important, and the fact that uh, Many experts from different disciplines are gathered here to discuss about these topics. It's a pioneering thing in Latin American region, so I hope this uh, conference repeats again in the future. So well, I will try to speak about quantum probability and what's, what will be the meaning of that and the differences with classical probability and how can we speak about a generalized probabilistic formalism. The story will start with uh, the work of Hilbert. Hilbert's sixth problem, uh, I will try to tell the idea behind it. So during the International Congress of Mathematicians held in Paris in 1900, David Hilbert presented a list of 23 problems of mathematics which, in his opinion, should occupy the efforts of mathematicians in the century to come. I'm going to quote Hilbert in his paper. You can, you can see the complete list of problems here, but we are going to refer only to the sixth problem. He says, the investigations on the foundations of geometry suggest the problem to treat in the same manner, by means of actions, those physical sciences in which mathematics plays an important part. In the first rank are the theory of probabilities and mechanics. This is very curious because he's situating probability in the physics side. He's uh, putting them together. So, so because he's dealing in this problem with the axiomatization of physical theories. And then he continues and says, as to the actions of the theory of probability, it seems to me desirable that their logical investigation should be accompanied by a rigorous and satisfactory development of the method of mean values in mathematical physics, and in particular, in the kinetic theory of gases. So Hilbert himself dedicated big efforts to solve his sixth problem. And the officially accepted solution for probability came in 1933, with Kolmogorov's axioms, which are based on measure theory. That's one of the most important axiomatizations. Of course, it is not the only one, but it was one of the first rigorous approaches. But Hilbert's contributions were influenced also in the development of relativity theory and in the development of quantum mechanics. Indeed, quantum mechanics acquired its rigorous axiomatic formulation after a series of papers by Hilbert, von Neumann, Norheim, and Wigner. And it is agreement when we say that uh, the definitive form of the quantum formalism was accomplished in the book of von Neumann in 1932. But it is important to remark that the book of Kolmogorov was published in 1933. But the first reasonable axiomatization of quantum probabilities appeared already in the year 27 by a paper of Hilbert, von Neumann, and Norheim, and there was an independent work of Jordan. And von Neumann's masterpiece was published in 1932. So these uh, different formalisms were developed together at the same time. But of course, the Kolmogorov's approach was more famous because uh, perhaps it was more difficult to understand quantum phenomena by that time. And of course, the vast majority of applications can be relied on Kolmogorov's actions. And another important historical fact is that Hilbert was von Neumann's advisor. So, that, so it is the same guy who posed the problem in the year 1900 and he afterwards uh, search for a concrete solutions to the problem that he posed. So first, in order to understand quantum probabilities, let us try to understand 
what is meant by a classical probability. But of course, most of you know about this, but I'm trying to point out some important facts about, about this that will be uh, used in the rest of the talk. So suppose that we throw a coin, and I, if I do a run of the experiment, I get two possible outcomes, heads or tails, X and Y, and a probability measure will be two numbers, PX and PY, between zero and one, that add up to unity. And for example, if the coin is unbiased, we will have PX equal to one half, equal to uh, PY. It will be a 50%, 50% coin. But in a more general situation, when you take a coin like this, you don't know if it is a biased coin or not. It could be a 70-30 coin and so on. So for this concrete coin, there are many, and indeed infinitely many, probabilistic states in which I could prepare the coin. The preparation involves the whole thing, the procedure of throwing the coin, and all the variables involved. And then I get the result, and then I can perform the statistics and measure whether this is a fair coin or not, and to try to determine the state by looking at the frequencies. But then, a probabilistic state of the coin will be given by the pair of numbers, px and py, and you can decompose a vector like this in this way, always, px product 1, 0, plus 1, minus px, because of this equation, 0, 1. And this will define, by varying the value of px, all possible states of the coin. So in one of the extremes, you have the state 1, 0. This state means that each time I throw the coin, I will obtain the outcome heads with probability 1. All the times that I throw it, I get 1. In the other extreme, you have 0, 1, which means that I obtain tails always. And just in between them, you have 1 half, 1 half, the first coin. But each point in this line segment will represent a possible probabilistic state of a physical system that has two possible outcomes. Now, the first observation that I want to make is that this line segment is a geometrical object. So in the rest of the talk, we will speak about the connection between probability theory and geometry. And there's another interesting connection, which is the connection with algebra. The possible outcomes of this coin are x and y. And then their conjunction as sets is the empty set, and the disjunction is the set x, y. This is very simple, but it is a very important algebraic structure, and it is known as the Boolean algebra of two elements. So this is the algebraic side, and this is the geometric side. Now let us see what happens with an experiment with three outcomes. I have x, y, and z, and then probabilities, px, py, pz, between 0 and 1, they add up to 1. And then when I start to look all possible probabilistic states of this system, uh, a quick study shields that all possible states can be considered as points in a triangle. And then for this model, we have a geometrical representation of all possible probabilistic states as points of a very concrete geometrical object, which is a triangle. Now, the algebra of events associated to these three outcomes set is given by x, y, and z, and then you can form, for example, the consumption, the, the disjunction between x and y. You can make x or y. If you want to bet on that, this will be represented by this set, and so on. x or zeta, this set, and so on. And for example, if this event happens, if this, is, this outcome actually happens, this one will also happen. So this will be an order set, because this was this guy will be lesser or equal than this one, and so on. And for example, you can make a conjunction. You can bet on this proposition and this proposition. And the conjunction will be just the intersection between sets. I am trying to tell this without doing mathematics, but there is a very concrete uh, algebraic structure with, behind this, which is that of a Boolean algebra. That will be a very important object for us. In a Boolean algebra, we have uh, lines that connect the, the different events that occur, that could occur as outcomes of an experiment, and these events are order, ordered, partially ordered, and we can make intersections, conjunctions, or disjunctions. 
for example, or for example, negations. The negation, the, the proposition X does not occur will be represented by this proposition here, which is either Y or either C that occur. So there is an algebraic structure going on and there is a geometry associated to these three outcomes probabilistic model. Just in case you don't remember, the set on the left is convex and the set on the right it is not. It is not because if I take the line showing these two points A and B, some points of the line lie outside of the set. So for every pro classical probabilistic model, the, st the set of all possible states of the system will be a convex set. And that is a very precise mathematical object. And we will see that it is much more precise. Because convex sets, for example, has, have uh, faces. For example, F1, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex will be faces of the convex set. But also this line here, this line here, and this line here. All these objects can be defined in a technical way. I will not do that. I will try to put it all with images and words. But this can be formalized very clearly. And every convex set has a collection of faces. We also add by completitude the empty set and the whole set. And it turns out that if that you look at the algebraic structure of the propositions associated to the outcomes of the experiments, and if you look at the algebraic structure can, that can be defined between faces, they are isomorphic. So the first message is that there is a connection between the algebra and the geometric representation of a probabilistic model. How is this? How do these lines, for example, this one is behind this one because they are included. This one is included in this one. And this one and this one are included in this, and this is the least upper bound. And for example, if you want to get this one, you compute the least, uh, the, the greatest lower bone between these, these guys here. So all of this can be formalized, and you get an isomorphism between the algebraic representation and the geometric representation. This will be very important, because I will tell the end of the story right now, so it is clear. In quantum mechanics, we will also have an isomorphism between the faces of the convex set and the lattice of propositions. But the algebra will not be a Boolean algebra. So the algebraic structure will be different to this one. And the geometry will not be a triangle or a line or what I am going to tell right now. We, the, the set of states or, or probabilistic measures associated to a quantum system forms a very concrete mathematical or geometrical object, which is different in shape from those of the models that come from classical probability theory. So what is a Boolean algebra? Boolean algebras are examples of lattices. Lattices are algebraic structures in which we can form conjunctions and disjunctions. They are partially ordered sets out of which we can always, given two elements, compute the greatest, uh, greatest lower bound and the a least upper bound between them. And for, so this is what we are saying. You can always compute the infimum and you can always compute the supremum. For Boolean algebras, the infimum and the supremum are coincident as concepts with the notion of conjunction as, and disjunction that we have in our everyday language. In quantum mechanics, we will have the same but the connectives will, will no longer have the same interpretation. The same happens for the negation. One has an orthocomplementation, which is meant to represent in Boolean algebras the negation. So summarizing, we have a system, and we have outcomes of the system, and we have propositions that we can make and empirically test about the outcomes of the experiment that we made on the system, and these propositions can be uh, can be, uh, uh, you can apply logical connectives to these propositions, and here it comes the important, the important thing. Boolean algebras are distributed, so this equality that comes from logic holds. If you think about propositional logic, you will remember that these things, uh, if, if you think about this, it, it holds. And there is an implication associated to the, to the partial order.
So for two possibilities, we have a line segment. For three, a triangle. If we have four outcomes, we get a tetrahedron, and so on. For n plus one possibilities, we obtain a very precise geometrical object, which is an n-simplex, which is a convex hull of n plus one points in an n-dimensional space. So classical probabilities, this is the first conclusion, have a very definite shape when you represent them geometrically. So each point of the convex set of states represents a probabilistic state of the system involved. Well, this is a dice. You have six outcomes and so on. So what Kolmogorov's actions say is that a probabilistic state on a system will, give even, will be given by a measure on an algebra of events. I will go to the next slide in which everything is simpler. Remember, the three outcome set, you have the preposition. You have x occurs, y occurs, or for example, this one will be x or y occur, or for example, this one could be said y or z occurs, or equivalently, not x occurs, and so on. So you have the propositions, and a probabilistic state will define a measure, like in measure theory. Like when you measure areas or volumes, so these this measures have very definite rules. And for example, if you know the probabilities of x, y, and theta, then the probability of the negation, uh, OK, yeah. remember that y and theta is not x. OK, so the probability of this guy here will be, will be given by a definite rule. So Kolmogorov actions tell you how to compute new probabilities out of others. Because if you know what is the probability of x, you can compute the probability of not x, which is given by y minus, y minus px. Or for example, for the, for the disjunction between x and y, x, the probability of x or y, will be given by the sum of the probabilities. So what Kolmogorov's actions do is put this in a very uh, rigorous mathematical formalism. So you will have that the probability mu will be a function defined over an algebra of possible uh, events, which is the propositional structure that I am talking, to the interval 0, 1. So you will, you will get numbers between 0 and 1. And then the measure of the empty set will be 0. The probability of the complement of a set will be 1 minus the probability of the set. And for any denumerable family of pairwise disjoint sets, you will have that the probability of the disjunction is the sum of the probabilities. So with these actions, Kolmogorov succeeded in including most of the models that were used in all the applications known by that time. And so this was a rigorous formulation of probability theory in the sense of the problem posed by Hilbert. So this, one of the, this was one of the first solutions. So now, in this setting, remember this. This thing here will be very important because the distinctive character of classical probability will be that this is a sigma algebra. And sigma algebras it's a, it's a technical notion, but they are Boolean algebras in the sense that I talked before, in the sense of this. You can make the conjunction, the disjunction, the negation, and the measures that we define there are compatible with these algebraic operations. So we see that there is a connection between measure theory, algebra, and geometry. This will be very important in quantum mechanics and in the works of von Neumann, as we will see very soon. So, when one speaks about probability theory, one has that uh, normal distribution, triangular, whatever distribution you have. But these are functions, functions on a given set. And out of these functions, you can define integrations and measures. So measure theory is going on. It will turn out that the probabilities that come from quantum systems will be very different mathematical objects. And they will be given by operators acting on Hilbert spaces. I will not go into the details, but I will try to give you the intuition uh, that lies behind that mathematical fact. So, summarizing, states of classical statistical or probabilistic theories can be considered as Kolmogorovian measures in the sense 
that I told you above. Observables will be random variables, like the, like the, the one defined by the outcomes of a coin. And notice that the, if you know about it, if you, for example, open the book of Cover and Thomas and you look at the foundations of information theory, you will see that one of the most important notions is that of probability. And the notion of probability used there is that of classical probability theory. So the formulation of information theory relies on the notions of probability and random variable. That is very important. Why? Because if now, if we change the underlying theory of probability, and instead of having classical probability, we have a sort of quantum probability, we will change information theory. And nowadays, uh, quantum information theory is a very active field of research. So far, so good. Now we try to turn into quantum probabilities. So the story, this is not the end of the story, and if you look at it from the historical point of view, it was also the beginning, because Hilbert was working on quantum probability even before the development of, well, it, it, this, this, this is not so fair, right? Because classical probability starts with game theory in, in much, much before, but, but the axiomatization is, is, is coetaneous. So, let us quote Richard Feynman, which is one of the most famous physicists uh, of the 20th century. He says, I should say that in spite of the implementation of the title of this talk, the concept of probability is not altered in quantum mechanics. When I say that the probability of a certain outcome of an experiment is P, I mean the conventional thing. That is, if the experiment is repeated many times, one expects that the fraction of those which keep the outcome in question is roughly p. It means frequencies. I will translate. It means that if I say that the probability of getting heads of this coin is 30%, then it means that if I throw it a thousand times, roughly 300 of the times will be heads, okay? So in quantum mechanics, this concept is not altered. But he says, and he points out, that what is changed and changed radically is the method of calculating probabilities. Remember that in Kolmogorov theory, we have a set of rules that give us how to compute new probabilities out of known probabilities. So if I know this guy here, I know how to compute this. So these rules are going to change in quantum mechanics. Not the meaning of Px. Well, not the meaning, at least in the operational way. Of course, there are several interpretations of classical probability, and those problems will remain in the quantum domain. But at least from the operational point of view, they remain similar. So in order to explain this, I will put a toy model developed by Fulis. Uh, it's a well-known example in quantum logic, and try to explain how is a quantum model, but of course it will not be a quantum model, it will be a game. It is just a simple game aimed to explain the ideas behind what comes next. So the game consists in that you have a box and a firefly that can fly, fly freely inside the box, so each run of the test of the experiment means that you will put the firefly on the box and you can do only two experiments. Either you look at the box from this side and you check whether the firefly is detected on the left or on the right, and if you choose this, you are not allowed to see what happened in the back. Or either you choose this experiment and you check whether the firefly is detected front or bottom. So there are two complementary experiments that cannot be performed at the same time. And for this experiment here, you have three outcomes. In one run of the experiment, it might happen that the firefly signals, I mean, she, she turns her light on on the right, or she turns the light on the left, or she doesn't turn the light at all. So you have left, right, or no signal, and a similar thing happens for front, bottom, or non-signal. So you have three outcomes per, uh, per experiment, and these experiments share a common outcome, which is no signal. They share something. So 
In a similar way as we did with the three outcome set or with the coin, we can form an algebra of propositions associated to this event. So if you perform this experiment here, you will have a three outcome experiment as in the classical case, because you, you can detect left, right, or no signal, and all possible conjunctions and disjunctions of these things and negations. Okay? So you will have something like a Boolean algebra here, and if, the, if you throw an ensemble of, of fireflies and you repeat the experiment many times, you will get possibly different outcomes each time, and you will be able to define probabilities if you prepare the, the firefly in a probabilistic state, and you will have a classical Kolmogorovian probability associated to this experiment. And also another one, perhaps a different one, associated to this experiment. So if you write down all possible propositions and try to build up the algebraic structure, as we did in the classical case, you will then end up with something like this, that looks like a Boolean algebra, but it is not. You have the same notions. It is an order set. You can compute the least upper bound of all L between two pairs of elements. You can compute the negation. You can compute the, the lower, uh, and, and so on. The ideas are the same. But the connectives will not behave classically, because this is not a Boolean algebra. I will show you why. So if you do the experiment, if you are on the left-right side, you can detect left, right, or no, or, or no signal. Or in, if you do the other experiment, you can have from, bottom, and no signal. Okay? But then it turns out that if you look at this propositional structure, it is not a Boolean algebra because it is a pasting of Boolean algebras. But the whole thing is not Boolean. For example, the distributive law that I mentioned before doesn't hold in this case. So you will have a Boolean algebra associated to the first experiment, a Boolean algebra associated to the second experiment, but the whole thing is not Boolean. So, OK. And, and this will be. You, you could define a probabilistic measure on this propositional structure and obtain a model of a non-classical probabilistic calculus. And you, will, you, will, you can complain because you say, well, the Firefly is a classical system. I could not play this game, your game, and just look at the thing from above and from all sides and just determine where the Firefly is and get a classical probabilistic model out of it. And that is true. But the idea is that in quantum mechanics, this will be for real. We will have systems that can be prepared in states for which there are complementary experiments that cannot be performed at the same time by any means because they are incompatible. So now it is not a game. Nature doesn't allow you to do that. And again, you will obtain this structure. You will obtain a Boolean algebra for one experiment. And if you change the setup and perform a complementary experiment, you will obtain a Boolean algebra. And the whole thing, the whole propositional structure will not be Boolean. So the probabilistic measures that you define on this structure will not be Kolmogorovian. Why? Because now the algebra will not be Boolean anymore. And the properties of the probabilities or measures that you define on this system will not be the same as those of classical systems. They will only be the same when you restrict to a Boolean subalgebra. If you just move here and never mix the results from here and there, you can stay on classical or Kolmogorovian probability. But when you mix propositions from here and from here, you break the rules of Kolmogorovian probability. Why is this so? Let me just tell in a nutshell what happens with quantum mechanics. If elementary particles were just small balls like this, and we throw the balls like one by one to a two-slip experiment, then what you will if they were just balls, what you would expect as an outcome is that some balls go from the enter on the, on the left and some on the right, and you will obtain something like this, like the, 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 the balls that pass the, 
the screens. But you don't get that. You don't really get that. You get something more like waves. Like, for example, when you make an interference uh, experiment with light, like a fringe with a bright a, a collection of fringes, bright and dark fringes, and you get an interference pattern. And then something very important happens. Under center, certain circumstances, you can prepare the quantum systems in such a way that you hit in the, this is a screen when you collect what is, what, where the particle is detected, and they hit the screen one by one. But when you make the statistics and throw dozens of them and then collect the statistical data, you will find that they form a pattern. And this pattern has the shape of a wave, as if it were an interference pattern. So this experiment here will be a wave-like experiment. And this experiment doesn't allow you to conclude which slit the particle passed. So you, if you do this experiment, you cannot decide what was the path taken by the, by the particle. But the strange things, or, or the, the, the surprising thing, is that if now I try to perform an experiment in order to determine what happened here, so I will put a detector symbolized here by an eye that looks which slit did the particle go, then the interference pattern will be destroyed. So the phenomena changes according to the experimental setup devised. So you have a, this probability distribution here, because of course there are fluctuations. You cannot predict which slit will. But this probability is compatible with particle trajectories. And this one is compatible with wave-like trajectories. So there are two complementary experiments that cannot be performed at the same time that give you two different probabilistic distributions. So the quantum state has the information, as a mathematical object, the quantum state gathers the information for both experiments. And the quantum state, as I explain you very soon, can be considered as a measure, as in measure theory, as I show you in Kolmogorov actions, but this measure will no longer be a measure over a Boolean algebra, but on a very different mathematical object. Not so very different, because Boolean algebras are orthomodular lattices, and also the lattices that appear in quantum mechanics are of the same kind, but have algebraic differences, and this will lead the, also to geometrical differences, as we will see. So I will, jump, I will skip the actions of quantum mechanics because I don't want to go into calculations. Of course, I leave it here because if some debate appears afterwards, we can come back to this and look at the details. But I will not speak about the quantum formalism. But the thing is, from a geometrical point of view, don't, don't worry if you don't know enough mathematics. A quantum state can be described as a trace class operator acting on a Hilbert space, trace class operator of trace one. So it will be positive, and the positive operators will form a cone. It will be trace one, and trace one operators form a hyperplane. So you have to intersect the cone with the hyperplane. And then you will get a convex set here. Again, the same as in classical probability, but this guy here is not a triangle or an n-simplex anymore. It will be a very different mathematical object and much more complicated. For the case of qubits, which is the most simplest, uh, which are the most simplest quantum system, the shape of the set of quantum states is a sphere. Remember that the ball. That, that, the, that the coin, which was the simplest classical probabilistic system, the coin was a line segment. Now, the simplest quantum system will have the, the geometry of a sphere. So, in classical systems, you have subset of a given set. And this was a Boolean algebra. You can form the, the disjunction, which is set union, the conjunction, which is set intersection. You have the 
the partial order relation, which is set inclusion, and the negation, which, which is set complement. Now it is all the same, but instead of sets, you have subspaces of a linear space. So now events in quantum mechanics will be represented by subspace of, subspaces of a separable Hilbert space, and this will have the structure of an orthomodular lattice. You can have something like conjunctions and disjunctions and a negation, but these connectives will no longer have the same interpretation as they have in classical logic. So this is why one of the reasons why this was called quantum logic by Virchow and von Neumann. Of course, if there are logicians here, logicians don't like to call quantum logic a logic. So the agreement is that it is an algebraic structure, but a very important one because it allows to uh, define a set of actions which are very similar to those of Kolmogorov that allow to recover quantum states as in, 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 in the shape of a measure theory, as we will see now. So just to give an idea, a proposition like this, like S subspace, represents something like the value of observable H lies in the interval AB. That could be, for example, the value of the energy lies between one joules and three joules. Not joules, like one mega electron volt and two mega electron volts. So that, that's the kind of testable propositions. Like the ball is on my left hand, the ball is on my right hand. That for, the, for this thing here will be a Boolean algebra because this is a classical object. But for a quantum system, it will not be a Boolean algebra. But the, pro the idea of proposition, of empirically testable proposition, is pretty much the same. The problem is that the algebraic structure that we use to represent those empirically testable propositions are not isomorphic to those of classical mechanics. So, for example, this law of distributivity, which holds some Boolean algebras, is no longer valid. And the same for, for example, you know this from elementary school. If you look at Venn diagrams and sets and compute areas, you will see that this is valid. Well, but this will not be valid for quantum probabilities. Whenever A and B come from incompatible measurements, so each time that you mix the statistic from one context with the statistic of a complementary context or experiment, you will end up in a violation of Kolmogorov's actions. So, a quantum state can be represented by a function that goes from the algebra of testable propositions of quantum systems, which will be projection operators associated to a Hilbert space, to the interval 0, 1, that satisfy that the probability of the null proposition is 0, the probability of the negation is 1 minus the probability, and so on. It's very similar to those of Kolmogorov. The difference lies in the fact that this guy here is not a Boolean algebra anymore. So with these actions, Gleason's theorem allows us to say that each measure of this form will be represented by a quantum state, represented by a density operator, and vice versa. So the shape is very similar, but the algebraic structure is not. And the geometry of the object defined by these actions will be very different too. It will be indeed much more complicated. So remember, this was the simplest Boolean algebra, the Boolean algebra of two elements. Now, the simplest quantum system will have something in common. But let me explain how, how is the phenomenology of this. The simplest quantum system is a spin one half particle. So you have a, a ray, or, or you can throw them one by one, spin one half particles, and make them pass through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And then if you prepare the system in a given state and make an orientation of the magnetic field in, such in, in a chosen direction, you may have two possible results, up or down. And that will be just like a coin, because the quantum state will give you the probability of going up and the probability of going down. But now, unlike the coin, 
you can do a measurement in a different direction, which is incompatible because you cannot orient the the magnet in two different di directions at the same time. So you have to make a complementary experiment, like in the firefly. But this is ontological because you cannot do that. So when you do that, you obtain a new coin, up and down, with new probabilities, and so on. Infinity, infinitely many directions of space. So look at this. The Boolean algebra only has one experiment, one ex empirical context. But in the quantum case, so you have the Boolean algebra structure here, 0, 1, x, y. So this one is the negation of this one, right? Because if this one happens, this one does not happen, and vice versa. And the quantum case will be like this. In one direction, you have one proposition and its negation. And this is a Boolean algebra. But besides this one, you will have this one, and so on, infinitely many. Boolean algebra is pasted together. And the quantum state defines a measure in the sense of measure theory over this algebraic structure. And you can show that this is equivalent to the density operators formalism or for pure states, uh, for pure states, normalized vectors on a Hilbert space. What happens with a Q treat? Well, it's pretty much the same. Now you will have each experimental, experimental context will be isomorphic to a Boolean algebra of three elements. But now these guys here, I put the, the old Boolean algebra just to compare. It's isomorphic, but these ones are sets and these ones are projection operators. The difference between the quantum and the classical cases is that the quantum case cannot be reduced to one measurement context. You need infinitely many measurement contexts in order to define the quantum state. Well, in order to uh, figure it out, you need not infinite memory, but I will not enter into that. But the thing is that you will have a pasting of Boolean algebras, which is not Boolean when you look at it from, from above. When you look at it locally from each experimental context, it will be a Boolean and, will, and you will re recover classical probability. But the whole thing is not classical. Another way to put it is that quantum states can be considered as families of infinitely many classical Kolmogorovian measures. But they are pasted together in a very harmonic way. And there's a lot of research on that because you want to know how this pasting comes about from a mathematical point of view, because it's, it's meaningful for experiments, because you can compare quantum theory with other alternative pastings and theories and try to see how the correlations are. So you can discard theories and ask which are the actions that singularize quantum mechanics out of all possible conceivable mathematical models. So, well, I will jump this because I think it's too mathematical. Now, entering to the last part of the talk, I will speak about von Neumann. So, he says that, uh, and one also has the parallelism that logic corresponds to set theory and probability theory corresponds to measure theory, and that a given system of logics, so given a system of sets, if all is right, you can introduce measures, you can introduce probability, and you can always do it in a very many different ways. Okay. And he says, in the quantum mechanical machinery, the situation is quite different. Namely, instead of the sets of use the linear subsets of a suitable space, say of a Hilbert space, the set theoretical situation of logics is replaced by the machinery of projective geometry, which is a very definite, again, geometrical object, which is in itself quite simple. So here again comes the connection between logic and geometry and probability theory. So in order to have probability, all you need is the concept of all angles. I mean angles other than 90 degrees. Now it is perfectly quite true that in geometry, as soon as you can define the right angle, you can define all angles. Another way to put it is that if you take the case of an orthogonal space, those mappings of this space on itself, which leave orthogonality intact, leave all the angles intact in other ways. In, a, in those systems which can be used as models of the logical background of, for quantum theory, it is true that as soon as all the ordinary concepts of logics are fixed under some isomorphic transformation, all of probability theory is already fixed. So then he concludes, this means, however, 
that one has a formal mechanism in which logics and probability theory arise simultaneously and are derived simultaneously. This was a, a project of von Neumann, study the connection between logic and probability, and of course, all is made through the machinery of geometry. He chose a generalization of projective geometry in order to do that. We have uh, made some research on this. You can check the papers afterwards if you want. But, well, it turns out that here, here comes the last part of the story, which is, is this the end of the story? No, because von Neumann didn't like it, Hilbert's space formalism, for many reasons that I will not discuss. But he started to look for alternative quantum models, new mathematical formalism that did quantum-like theories but are not strictly equal to quantum mechanics. And they found them in a series of papers Murray and von Neumann searched for algebras more general than those which appear in quantum mechanics. These new algebras are nowadays called von Neumann algebras, and their elementary components can be classified as type 2, type 1, and type 3. And classical and quantum models are included in this machinery, because all classical probabilistic models can be described as a Boolean or Abelian von Neumann algebras. So this machinery is a generalization of, of, of classical probability theory and includes quantum probability theory. So further work revealed that a rigorous treatment to the axiomatization of systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom in quantum mechanics needed the use of more general von Neumann algebras. So I will, I will show the, the mathematical details. And, but the important thing is this. Now you can give the actions of a generalized probabilistic theory, which is like this. Start with an algebraic structure, L, that represents all the propositions that you can make about your system, about the outcomes of your system. So a state will be a measure from this to the interval 0, 1, satisfying the usual actions of measure theory. When this lattice is Boolean, we get classical Kolmogorovian probabilistic theory. When it is not Boolean, we, we get a departure from the classical case. In the case of quantum theories, we get a very specific mathematical structure which is, for example, those uh, lattices that come from von Neumann algebras. But one can conceive more general models. And here I put some, some drawings. Remember that the, that the coin was geometrically represented by a line segment. The qubit was all points here are quantum states, and, but the, the geometric shape is that of a sphere. But one could, could conceive more general models at least in an ideal sense. Why not? And then you can, you can speak about generalized probabilistic theory, in which you have convex sets associated to probabilistic models and so on. And the shape is very important here because it is connected with algebra. Remember the isomorphism between the faces of a convex set and the lattice of propositions. So, but then, if one can conceive more general probabilistic models, one may ask, which is the right action? axiomatization for probability theory in all applications. Quantum mechanics show us a domain of phenomena in which the more natural way uh, to work is to assume that we have non-Kolmogorovian probability, because quantum states in this sense are non-Kolmogorovian measures. But then one may ask, is it possible to find violation of the Kolmogorovian model outside of quantum mechanics, or in a more correct way, is it useful to use them outside of quantum mechanics? Well, in the last years, there are many researches uh, in that direction. Many researchers are trying to study quantum-like models in applications to problems in biology, cognition, economics, and so on. So one question is, is it possible to give a unified approach to all those applications? Are those applications really useful? Of course, they are possible. People do that, and they can model what happens. In, in principle, they work. But the question is, should people change and move onto this framework or not? In the quantum case, I have no doubt about it. It will be a complete uh, mistake to use classical probability and in the usual sense to, to describe quantum phenomena. 
it is more comfortable to use quantum states. But this opens the question about, is it possible to use it outside the quantum domain? So we have made some research about this. You can look at these references. And this has implications, because if you change the probabilistic, the underlying probabilistic theory, you will get a different information theory. Quantum information theory is really different from classical information theory. This is why it is very promising as a technological development. And many governments and companies are investing a lot of money in order to build quantum computer, computers, quantum communication systems, quantum internet, and so on. So we have worked out an interpretation for all this, for the generalized probabilistic models approach, which is suppose that there is an empirical scenario in which a rational agent, which could be an automata, this, this has nothing to do with consciousness, must take a decision. And with that aim, he must define a degree of belief function. How likely is that this event will happen or not? So different possible experiments or results are available, and they are organized in an event structure, like in classical probability as, and in quantum mechanics, assumed to be an orthomodular lattice. If the lattice is Boolean, then we prove that you recover, using Cox's approach, it is possible to prove that you recover cosmograph actions. But on the contrary, if the states of affairs that the Asian must face presents non-classical features like contextuality, it is more natural to use a non kolmogorovian probabilistic calculus. And the natural information measures will be Shannon's in the Boolean case, and in the quantum case, it will be von Neumann's entropy. And you can define generalized entropic measures for more, more general theories. Well, this is a summary. Here you can check the references of Cox's work. And this is our work for the quantum case. So I will jump this because I think that I have no time. So this has a model for epistemology. What will be? It is that if you get a theory, like quantum mechanics, then the theory defines what is experimentally testable. It will tell you which are the experimentally testable propositions. In quantum mechanics, our projections are represented mathematically, but projections acting on a Hilbert space. And then, out of this, you define all possible compatible measures, compatible with the algebra of propositions. And then you'll, you will get the geometry of the set of states. And the same for a the classical theory. But now come with a different theory. And you can play the same game. So it, it will be a, like a general general uh, structure and in la underlying probabilistic theories. I will jump this. Uh, just to end up, you, you might question what are classical probabilities in a quantum domain. I already say this, but I think it is important to say it again. Classical probabilities are not gone because this lattice here, the whole propositional structure may be non-classical, non-Boolean, but a concrete observable has to be Boolean. Each time you make a concrete experimental setup, you put everything in the table of your lab, arrange the laser. Once you specify that, you will get a classical probabilistic distribution. So this guy here is not Kolmogorovian. You have no, non-Boolean, non-Kolmogorovian measure. But when you make the composition of this guy with a concrete observable, you get a classical measure. So each generalized probabilistic model will be a family in the sense of being an harmonic pasting of classical Kolmogorovian probabilistic measures. But the whole thing is not classical. So just to conclude, we have discussed the formal structure of probabilities in quantum mechanics. We have seen that these probabilities can be considered as non-Kolmogorovian in the sense that the sigma algebra is not, no longer a Boolean one. Thus, one can speak of a non-commutative probabilistic calculus that can be suitably generalized. This has implications for many disciplines, especially for information theory. A concrete example is quantum information theory. Here you can find, uh, of course, if you send me an email, I can send you the papers, no problem, a list of references of our work in which we have discussed this largely and all the technical details that have no mentioned in this talk. And well, that's all. Thanks uh, for your attention. And, and before, before finishing, I would like to make a comment, which is that 
every year in, in, in Argentina, we change city, but it is always in, in Argentina, we organize a conference on quantum foundations that gathers uh, physicists, philosophers, and mathematicians. So if you are interested uh, to come, uh, you are welcome. Next uh, meeting will be in Córdoba uh, from uh, 27 to 29 of November of this year. And next year, for students and people interested in learning, researchers interested in, in learn, learn about quantum mechanics, in April, we organize the school called Quantos, which is a school on quantum mechanics and quantum information theory. And of course, you are invited to come. So if you are interested, just send me an email, and I will send you the details. Well, uh, thanks for your attention. Any questions or observations? Otherwise, we can move on <laughs> to the coffee break. So this is something I've, I've always wondered, and I'm hoping you can clarify it for me. And I think you talked about it at the end there. So suppose we do your spin experiment that we were talking about, where we have a particle, and we've got a magnet that we can orient. And let's just say we can put it in the x direction, we can put it in the y direction, or we can put it in any combination of those, right? And what I'm trying to make sure I understand is which languages, which descriptions of these, this situation requires the non-classical probabilities. So one thing I can do is I can describe the underlying quantum state of the particle as with just a vector that is some combination of x and y. And if I don't know the state of the particle, I could have a, a classical probability distribution over the possible states of the vector. So that's one thing I could do. That's classical. Mm -hmm. The other thing I can do is I can say, given that I'm going to orient my magnet in the x direction, what are the possible measurement outcomes I will get? And that also, as you just said, is a simple Boolean algebra, and I get classical probabilities. So the place where I get non-classical probabilities is if I insist on talking about, is the electron, what is its spin in the x direction, right? If I say, what's its spin in the x direction, the answer could be up, down, or neither. And then if I say, what does it spin in the y direction, it could be up, down, or neither. And when you put all those sorts of propositions together, you get a non-Boolean algebra, right? So it's at that level of talking where I insist on talking about what is the spin state of the electron it's, or whatever of the particle itself, not talking about how are my measurements going to come out. It's when I talk that way that I run into the non-classical logics and the non-classical probability and things like that. Is that right? Because I've always just wondered and wanted to get that pinned down. If I understood correctly, I think that you are right. And it is important to consider this example, which is uh, not, uh, I, I think that it is better if you, you start with this. Take fermion mechanics. You know fermion mechanics. The ontology is classical. It's just billiard balls moving in space time according and interacting with a weird potential, <laughs> which we don't know what it is, but it is, the ontology is completely classical, and the probabilities lying and governing the behavior of the hidden variables are classical. So that is a concrete example. So do you want classical probabilities? Yes, they are not gone, of course. But be careful, because if you want to solve, I don't know, a concrete quantum problem using fermion mechanics, it might be very difficult. <laughs> so it is not a question, it, a matter of you're obliged to use non Kolmogorevian, but it is very useful. This is what I'm pointing out. This mathematical machinery is very useful. The one of using, uh, instead of an Abelian algebra, we are using a non Abelian algebra of observables that allows you to represent order effects, because if you measure this and measure that, might be not the same of measuring this and that, or you can do this or that. Sometimes this mathematical machinery makes things simpler, making it to be uh, the right approach to many problems. In that way, of course, if at the end of the day, you don't like this non-Kolmogorovian, you can go to sleep and think that, okay, 
it's okay. You wake up in the night, like, sweating, dreaming about non-classical logic, quantum probability. Oh, no, no, no. There's always Bohmian mechanics. But perhaps that, that is, makes you feel comfortable with your faith, but it is not so useful. And I'm not saying that Bohmian mechanic is not useful. For some concrete problems, it's useful. There's a guy that applies Bohmian mechanics to uh, economical problems, you know, modeling markets. I'm not saying it is not useful. What I'm saying is for many applications, it is better to use the non-commutative, at least for quantum mechanics. Of course, we can argue whether it is useful in other disciplines or not. Some people claim that very strongly. I will be cautious. Yes, uh, if I understood well, uh, random variables in the quantum probability are the same objects that are in the, cl in the classical model. And, and if not, uh, do you have in the quantum probability uh, something related to the equivalent to law of large numbers and central limit theorem that allows you later on to, to do test hypothesis, which in, at the bottom end allow you to make decision, which is the, the, the goal that you want to in, in, for application to to make decisions. So do you have all this equivalent machinery in the quantum setting? Yeah, my answer is yes. You can use, for example, Maxon principle, you can use inference methods to figure out which is the unknown quantum state and so on. And in general, everything must work because when you perform a concrete experiment, mm -hmm. it is classical. So the law of large numbers works there. So su suppose that you, you speak about the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty. If you want to test it empirically, what you have to do is first prepare the system in a quantum, uh, prepare a quantum state, then make infinitely many copies of it, mm -hmm. and then take an, a subensemble mm -hmm. and measure position. Mm -hmm. And you will end up with a, with a curve and you will compute the, the, the variance, right? Mm -hmm. And then you do now a, a complementary experiment and do the same for momentum. And everything works there, and it has to work, otherwise it will be meaningless. And then you gather everything together and again, then get the uncertainty relation. But all uh, uh, usual statistical uh, considerations work, provided that you make the mutatis mutandis changes. Uh, I don't know if that counts as a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. but the, you have a kind of a inference theory in quantum mechanics, so you can, yeah. And again, in each classical context, you can apply Bayes' theorem, Bayes' rule, and there is quantum Bayes' rule. There's a lot of people working on that. But I might say that it's an ongoing field of research. Thank you. Uh, so this, I guess, ties into the last thing you were saying in response to the previous question. I was partly just kind of curious about how uh, updating would work in uh, the quantum case um, when you don't have standard conditionalization. Um, and also whether, so you say, you know, right, we can always, if we want to, you can always keep the standard Boolean algebra. You know, you just have to have more stuff in there that sometimes you can't see. Um, and whether sometimes it seems like, I mean, I don't know enough about quantum mechanics to know this, but it seems like sometimes I might want to update my beliefs based on things that aren't observable so that I, you know, I learn that something's in a superposition. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the outcome yet. Maybe I learned this in a superposition. I want to revise my beliefs, but those superpositions won't be represented in the algebra. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's going to be a cost for going to the kind of quantum version of the information or quantum version instead of just keeping all the propositions uh, represented. Is that right or is that not right? Well, let, let me complete it. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it, 
superpositions can be represented in the algebra. Huh? You, you can. All, all, all possible states and superpositions can be represented. But the problem that I see when you speak about updating information is that, is that information really there? Here it comes to interpretation, because there's a great debate in quantum mechanics about hidden variables. But it turns out that you cannot, they are hidden. <laughs> so don't try to update because they are hidden. You will never know by construction, which is a very odd epistemological notion. No? It's something that you cannot control and you will never know. It's not just something abstract like a magnetic field. You cannot look at magnetic fields, but you can prepare them in different states and measure. So there is control on this abstract thing. But that is one thing. And then if you, if you stick to a very uh, Copenhagen ontology, there's nothing to update because there's no position of the particle. So it turns out that when you prepare the quantum system and make one measurement, usually you destroy the system. <laughs> so for example, if you measure a photon, the photon will be absorbed and he will never be there anymore for you. You will have to prepare an identical copy and do the experiment again. And it will yield a different result and so on. So updating is tricky here because perhaps if you take this radical ontology, there's nothing to update. But from the mathematical point of view, it works because let me show you an example. I don't know if this will answer your question, but I think it's interesting to know. You know the max n principle. If you don't know nothing about throwing a dice, you will put probability one six. But I, then I come and I tell you, no, no, someone comes and says, no, Federico is cheating. The first phase appears with probability 40%. And now you, know, you gather information and you will update. And that you can do in quantum mechanics. It's just replacing uh, the, the, the classical state, which will be a simplex with the more general geometric object. In this object here, you have measures between probabilistic distributions. You, you can compare them. And you have a, a function of, uh, of being close. You have a notion of being successful. You see? So you can update. If I give you more, if I give you not too much information, you won't know much about the quantum, the unknown quantum state. But if I give you more and more information, you will be able to determine the quantum state. But now the thing is that the object that you want to determine is not the defined thing. In classical probability, if something is, is classical and you start to update and update, you will end up. The guy was seated there, or there were 10 persons in the room. Before that, you had a probability reflecting ignorance. But here, you don't have ignorance, because the only thing that there is, according to this orthodox formulation of quantum mechanics, is a probability distribution. And you can update. The probability distribution, you can update. So I think that, I don't know if this is answering your question, because as you can see, it's tricky, because you measure and you destroy or perturb. So what is updating? You have to be careful. Yeah, I mean, I was wondering, does it look a lot like the generalization? Does it look a lot like the, I mean, the ways for updating, does it look a lot like standard conditionalization, or does it look, um, you know, something, something more generalized to uh, just kind of technical, uh, more, more just of a technical question there? No, I, I don't know, because, um, the conditional in quantum mechanics is tricky mm -hmm. because when you want to define the conditional for infinite dimensional models, you have to be very careful with the mathematics, especially for continuous spectrum. For a discrete spectrum, it works quite well. I can give you a book where, but I don't know the end of the story with that because things that you don't follow because I don't know, right? but, but, but there's a very concrete sense in which you cannot update information. I will have to look at Jeffrey conditionalization, but uh, so I don't know. So uh, thank you again, Professor Federico. Thanks you. Vou apresentar a professora Juliana rapidamente. So our second speaker of today is Professor uh, Juliana Bueno, whose conference 
is called In Defense of Probabilistic Pluralism, the remarkable connection between logical pluralism and alternative theories of probability. Uh, Professor Juliana is a mathematician, mathematician from the University of Campinas, and uh, her main areas of research are uh, logics, philosophy, per consistent logic, and foundations of probability theory. Uh, really, thank you for coming here, Professor Juliana. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my slides are in, in English. I prefer to present in Portuguese, but I can answer in, in English if someone has some, some questions, okay? Uh, bem, o, o meu trabalho, é, eu estou trabalhando com teorias de probabilidade para consistentes, né? e um, uma das questões que surgiram, né, quando eu comecei a trabalhar com, com teorias de probabilidade alternativas, baseadas em lógicas para consistentes, é uma, uma questão que surgiu e aí que deu origem a esse trabalho aqui, que, que, estou, que fala sobre o pluralismo probabilístico, é se havia ou não diferença entre uma teoria de probabilidade baseada numa lógica para consistente ou numa lógica para consistente alternativa. E, e aí, então, a motivação para esse trabalho foi buscar uma resposta para essa questão. Então, eu vou apresentar aqui qual é a relação entre lógica e probabilidade, em que sentido é, eu estou conectando, olhando para essas, dois, essas duas vertentes né, que a gente usa para modelar o raciocínio. E e tentar defender que, sim, faz sentido um pluralismo probabilístico, inclusive se eu estou trabalhando com lógicas que, de mesma natureza, como, por exemplo, as lógicas para consistentes, que é o que eu vou é, restringir aqui mais a minha, a minha fala. Então, o, o ponto né, o que, eu, que eu quero defender é que, Assim como a, a teoria de probabilidade, ela, ela é essencial, a clássica, né? ela é essencial para análise estatística. E, e na estatística, é, a gente usa como uma ferramenta para a, a ciência, assim como o Pablo discutiu né, ontem é, na, sua, na sua apresentação, é, se a gente tiver um pluralismo probabilístico, então isso também vai ter um impacto direto na forma como a gente entende a filosofia da ciência, entende a ciência. Então, acho que é um, um assunto relevante para a gente estar tá discutindo. Bom, é, vou apresentar rapidamente aqui um pouco sobre o que é o pluralismo lógico, quais são os principais pontos de defesa de um pluralismo lógico, para então, é, baseado nessa defesa, aí, defender um pluralismo probabilístico, e depois vou restringir aí o trabalho na, na teoria de probabilidade para consistente e vou mostrar um, uma aplicação, né, como que a gente poderia, pode aplicar essa teoria de probabilidade alternativa num, num, num estudo de caso. Bom, o termo pluralismo, ele se refere a diferentes visões de mundo né, a respeito de um mesmo conceito. E uma visão oposta é o monismo, ou seja, ficar preso numa única forma de, de compreender um, um certo assunto. O pluralismo lógico é aquela visão que defende que existe mais de uma lógica que seja correta. Então, entendendo lógica como uma relação de consequência, ou seja, a relação de consequência é um preservador de verdades, e, e aí, dependendo do contexto, a gente pode 
defender que existe sim um diferentes formas de de, de lógica para diferentes contextos. E aí a gente tem vários defensores dessa visão, né? Rudolf Carnap, por exemplo, é um que defende a, a, o pluralismo lógico, né? então ele é bastante liberal nessa, nesse aspecto, e que ele defende que cada um tem a liberdade de construir o seu, o seu próprio sistema para o seu para determinado propósito, você pode sim ter um, uma determinada lógica, e, e ele defende que isso é positivo, mesmo porque isso é, permite, abre espaço para uma inovação em, em lógica. E aí, se, se o sistema é bom ou não, isso é algo que vem depois, a gente, com criticismo, a gente pode filtrar no futuro, é, se essa lógica é o caso ou não. Entendeu? Então, ele é bastante liberal nesse sentido. E, então, ele justifica o pluralismo lógico, mais ou menos nessa, nessa via. Um mais recente, o Gillian Russell, que tem uma entrada na, na Stanford, falando sobre é, o pluralismo lógico, ele, ele também defende, vai nessa mesma linha do Carnap, e defende que é, a lógica pode ser, sim, é, o pluralismo lógico ele é defensável, porque se a gente entender o, a relação de consequência como um portador de verdade, você é, pode trabalhar em contextos distintos, como falando em proposições sobre conjuntos, que, que é diferente de falar em conjunto de proposições, ou seja, dependendo do, dependente do contexto, a gente tem, sim, um, um portador de verdade para aquele contexto. Então, ele também vai defendendo aí o, o pluralismo lógico nessa, nessa linha aqui. Uma outra linha é, que também podemos defender o pluralismo lógico é se a gente entende a lógica como um modelo para a linguagem natural. Então, se é um modelo, é, vai ter suas falhas, então faz sentido que a gente tenha modelos concorrentes, ou seja, lógicas concorrentes, para expressar a, a, linguagem, a linguagem natural. Então, também é uma outra maneira aí de estar tá entendendo, defendendo o uso aí do pluralismo lógico. E uma... Uma, uma outra via também entender a, a se, se, eu, se eu entendo a, a, a lógica como é, normativa né? e, 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 eu, e eu tento falar de moral e aí a, quando eu tô é, eu tenho diferentes normas né? a seguir então um agente racional né? ideal idealizado ele poderia seguir diferentes normas. Então, aí também eu poderia ter diferentes é, lógicas, cada uma normatizando um tipo de, de norma ali. Então, aí também é outra maneira de justificar o, o pluralismo lógico. Tá? Então, só assim, mesmo para. É, a ideia aqui é só dar alguns exemplos de como que eu o pluralismo lógico ele pode ser defendido, embora tenham é, nomes de peso que são contrários a essa visão pluralista, como Quine, por exemplo. Tá? Mas o importante aqui é que é possível defender o pluralismo lógico. É esse o ponto que mais me importa. Bom, a relação entre lógica e probabilidade, a gente pode... Entender de duas maneiras. Então, a gente tem a, a teoria de probabilidade, que a teoria, as teorias lógicas, que é uma ferramenta mais é, que permite uma análise mais qualitativa a respeito da forma de raciocínio. Quando a gente usa a teoria de probabilidade, a gente tem uma forma de análise quantitativa. Então, a gente tem duas faces aí, duas formas de de analisar 
a, a, a forma de raciocínio e a gente aplica essas, é, essas, esses formatos aí em inteligência artificial, ciência cognitiva, ou seja, diferentes áreas é, fazem uso da, dessas, log, dessas teorias aí para entender ou modelar o raciocínio. A interação entre lógica e probabilidade ela pode ocorrer pelo menos duas formas. Uma delas, eu posso utilizar a lógica para modelar o que, que é, o, que, como, o que, que eu entendo por probabilidade. E aí, então, nesse sentido, o, o desenvolvimento da lógica vai ser estender a linguagem para que eu possa expressar o conceito de probabilidade. E aí, claro que, nesse sentido, o que, que eu tenho que fazer ao modelar a, a, o conceito de probabilidade é assumir uma interpretação para eu poder fazer essa, essa modelagem. Então, essa é uma, uma via aí de, de trabalho em que a gente conecta lógica e probabilidade. Um segundo, é, uma segunda abordagem é caracterizar a lógica por meio de uma, de uma semântica probabilística. O que, que é fazer isso? Aqui, a semântica probabilística, a gente reinterpreta a forma de compreender a relação de consequência. Na lógica, a gente tem que a relação de consequência é, é preserva a verdade. Então, gama deduz alfa, significa que é impossível, né? Se as premissas são verdadeiras, a conclusão é falsa, é, a conclusão vai ser verdadeira. É impossível que a conclusão seja falsa se as premissas são verdadeiras. Quando a gente vai para um contexto probabilístico, a, a ideia de, de relação de consequência, eu substituo a noção de verdade por probabilidade. E aí, se eu tenho, atribuo uma probabilidade máxima, ou seja, é 100%, de chance de que as proposições, a, as hipóteses sejam verdadeiras, então a conclusão vai ter probabilidade máxima também de ser verdadeira. E aí, nesse contexto, a gente coincide. A, a medida de probabilidade e valoração, elas coincidem. Mas a gente pode pensar de forma é, em graus de incerteza, ou seja, quanto de incerteza a gente transfere da premissa para a conclusão. Então, essa é uma outra maneira de entender a relação de consequência, e aí a gente tem a análise das semânticas probabilísticas associadas com a lógica. Aí é claro que aí é, existe em debates em que a gente pode perguntar ó, incerteza com relação a quê, né, que está sendo transferido. Mas essa é uma outra... Uma outra questão, eu aqui só quero entender mesmo essa relação de lógica com probabilidade. O, o Adams, ele, no trabalho A Prime of Probability Logic, ele defende que essa conexão de semântica probabilística e, e lógica, ele entende que a lógica que está associada com a teoria de probabilidade, é a lógica clássica. Então, quando ele está falando no trabalho dele é, dessa relação de consequência em que eu analiso quanto de incerteza eu consigo passar, transmitir para a consequência, numa relação de consequência, ele está argumentando aí, mostrando que existe essa conexão entre lógica e probabilidade, e no caso aí, teoria de probabilidade clássica com lógica clássica. É exatamente nesse ponto que a gente começa a divergir. Porque se a gente tem um pluralismo de lógicas, a pergunta é por que a gente tem que se restringir a uma única teoria de probabilidade. Então, se a gente tem um pluralismo lógico, é natural imaginar que a gente possa ter também um pluralismo probabilístico. E aí, como seria... Essa, essa noção alternativa aí de probabilidade enquanto associada com a lógica. Então, o pluralismo probabilístico que eu vou estar tá me referindo aqui, 
É uma visão que, vá, que a gente pode existir, sim, diferentes noções de, de, de teoria de probabilidade, ou seja, formas de medir, elas podem ser alternativas. E, e aí, então, ou seja, eu posso associar uma teoria de probabilidade a uma lógica intuicionista, onde eu tenho uma ideia de, é, bastante rígida, né, o que é noção de prova, uma, algo construtivo, eu poderia pensar numa lógica que tem três valores, ou N valores de verdade, uma lógica multivalente. Então, para cada tipo de lógica, em princípio, eu teria uma teoria de, da medida diferente. E aí a pergunta é, qual, o, que isso, o que isso impacta né, no, nos problemas? Que tipo de problema a gente conseguiria tratar dentro desse universo probabilístico? Então, eu vou defender que, que, que faz sentido. Tá? E vou restringir, esse, essa, vou abrir essa questão aqui para um, uma um pluralismo mais restrito, que é o pluralismo em teorias baseadas em lógicas para consistentes. Tá? Bom, começando aqui pela teoria de probabilidade de Komogorov, eu vou colocar uma situação em que a gente pode defender né, o, o uso de probabilidades alternativas, mas o Federico acabou de apresentar né, as, as, os fundamentos aí de uma teoria de probabilidade não como Gorovina. Então, é, já abri o caminho aqui para a minha apresentação. Adorei o trabalho, porque ele fala sobre um aspecto que eu ainda preciso trabalhar aqui no meu, na minha pesquisa, que é, na, é investigar melhor a questão algébrica. Então, eu estou mais associada com a, a, os axiomas que a, a função de probabilidade ela vai, vai respeitar. Então, aqui, os, os axiomas de Komogorov, eles trabalham com probabilidade associadas a, a eventos, entendendo conjuntos, e... E aí, dentro da, dos axiomas de, de Kolmogorov, a gente, consegue, a gente define o que é probabilidade condicional. A probabilidade condicional é dada por esta fórmula aí, probabilidade de A e B dividido pela probabilidade de B, com a restrição de que o denominador não pode ser zero. É, essa noção de... de probabilidade condicional, se a gente particularizar ela para a pergunta qual a probabilidade de A dado não A, negação aqui clássica, né? isso daqui facilmente a gente deriva que é igual a zero, porque a interseção entre o conjunto e seu complemento é o conjunto vazio, então isso dá zero. Mas aí a gente pergunta, mas será que é necessário que essa probabilidade de A e não A seja igual a zero. Né? Então, a motivação é, se a gente pensar em informação, a respeito de uma certa proposição, e, e a gente, se a gente sabe, por exemplo, que a, que a informação não é confiável, que razão que a gente tem para aceitar que a probabilidade de A e não A é de fato igual a zero? Então, nesse sentido aqui, é, a gente começa a abrir espaço para que, sim, existe, é, é justificável uma noção diferente de, de probabilidade em que a gente possa romper com este princípio, né, de que probabilidade de A e não A seja igual a zero. Então, na lógica... É, para consistente, a gente vai, a gente tem um espaço lógico para trabalhar com esse tipo de situ situação. E é isso que a gente tem explorado. Bom, para poder fazer esse tipo de análise, a gente vai seguir na, na, numa abordagem mais na linha do Carnap, 
em que a gente atribui probabilidade não a conjuntos, mas sim a sentenças. Então, faz mais sentido para a gente é, entender a probabilidade dessa forma. Mesmo porque a gente precisa ainda de uma compreensão mais profunda o, a respeito da, da questão algébrica associada às lógicas para consistentes. Já se sabe que a gente não consegue uma algebrização é, tipo Lindenbaltarsky para lógicas para consistentes. A gente precisa de uma noção mais abstrata de, de álgebra para poder caracterizar, ou seja, a, as álgebras não são elementares, né? não, não são booleanas. Então, esse é um, um complicador. Bom, vou falar um pouco agora, então, o que, que é a lógica para consistente? Essa lógica que é, a gente tem trabalhado e qual que é a diferença dela para a lógica clássica. Bom, na lógica clássica, a, a negação ela é explosiva, no sentido em que o sistema não admite contradição. Se eu tenho, a, a, na, na, em face à contradição, o que acontece com o sistema é que ele se trivializa, eu derivo qualquer coisa. Né? A lógica para consistente vai romper com este princípio. Não é que a lógica para consistente ela deriva contradições. É diferente. A, a lógica para consistente tem uma negação que suporta a contradição. Então, a, a negação não é necessariamente explosiva. E isso a gente entende em, em contextos né, da vida cotidiana. Ou seja, se eu tiver uma informação contraditória a respeito da temperatura, não é problemático. Eu, eu, a gente lida muito bem com esse tipo de, de informação. Agora, uma informação contraditória com relação a, aos meus dados bancários, né, o meu saldo no banco, isso, isso já é problemático. Ou seja, eu não vou aceitar contradição nesse contexto. Então, a lógica para consistente é um ambiente em que a gente consegue separar essas... Essas duas, esses dois tipos de, de contradição. Né? Então, o que a gente faz, a, as lógicas da inconsistência formal, é um ramo da lógica para consistente. A gente tem a, as, as lógicas do, do Newton da Costa, que trabalha com os, o cálculo CN, que, diferente da, das lógicas da inconsistência formal, o conceito de consistência ele é definido dentro da linguagem no sistema de da costa. E aqui nas lógicas da inconsistência formal, a gente trabalha essa, esse conceito como um, um novo operador. A gente adiciona esse novo operador na linguagem com, essa, com, com a bolinha branca e com a bolinha preta. A bolinha branca representa a consistência e a bolinha preta a inconsistência. E aí, então, os sistemas, eles são definidos colocando os axiomas que governam esses novos operadores, que, que, que é uma forma de controlar a negação. Ou seja, é através desse, desse novo conectivo que a gente é, vai dizer qual contradição é perigosa, e essa sim eu tenho que olhar com cuidado e imaginar que ali eu tenho... Se, é, e, e, e nesse contexto eu tenho uma atitude clássica perante a contradição e as outras, uma outra negação que se ocorrer contradição nesse outro contexto não é problemático. Então a gente consegue separar esses dois universos. E aqui a gente tem uma visão diferente de, de, de paraconsistência da, daquela defendida pelo Priest, que é a de, do comprometimento ontológico. Ou seja, o, o Priest trabalha com, a, defende a ideia de que contradição existe no mundo. Na, na, na nossa abordagem aqui, a gente não precisa se comprometer. Se a contradição aparecer, a gente lida com ela. 
mas a gente não precisa é, se comprometer que elas existem de fato. Então, a gente não trabalha com esse pressuposto filosófico. E aí o princípio da explosão a gente substitui por este princípio mais brando, que é o princípio da explosão gentil, em que a gente diz a contradição ela só é problemática para aquelas fórmulas, para aquelas situações, para aquelas sentenças em que a gente diz que são problemáticas, para aqueles contextos que realmente importam. Então, é, e a gente descreve nesse novo princípio aí, bola alfa, junto com a contradição, é que sim, a gente restaura a, a trivialização. Mas se não for consistente, ou seja, se, eu, se ela não for delicada, então a gente não tem problema. Bom, só para mostrar aqui um universo de, de lógicas para consistentes, um pequeno universo que a gente tem aqui, e que são três ramos é, de lógicas, partindo aqui do, do cálculo proposicional positivo, a gente pode expandir essa linguagem colocando a negação fraca, por exemplo, com o axioma A ou não A, aí a gente obtém o sistema que a gente chama de PI. E esse sistema é um sistema para consistente, porque a negação ela só, ela só, só, só tem que seguir esse único axioma. E aí a gente consegue é, contra, colocar, modelar aí situações é, em que existe a contradição. Né? E aí a gente vai aumentando, colocando novos axiomas e tem aqui uma série de, de, de sistemas até que a gente atinge a lógica clássica. Que eu estou falando lógica proposicional. Essas lógicas aqui não são caracterizáveis por matrizes finitas, né? nessa, nessa linha horizontal. Aí. São lógicas é, com semântica bivalorada. Essa outra linha aqui em diagonal, a gente tem lógicas para consistentes trivalentes. Essa LP é a lógica do Priest. Não é uma, uma, é uma lógica para consistente de três valores, e a gente pode expandir também, aumenta, colocando novos axiomas, até atingir a lógica clássica. Essas lógicas aqui, que eu estou sublinhando em vermelho, são as lógicas que nós trabalhamos para é, propor uma teoria de probabilidade baseada nessas três lógicas. Essa aqui, a let f, é uma lógica que estende a lógica do first degree entailment, do, é, do Belknap, Dan e Belknap, que é uma lógica não determinística. E também a gente consegue estender essa daí para uma, uma lógica clássica. Então, são três lógicas, digamos, com, com DNA de, diferentes, né? que a gente pode estar tá trabalhando com três teorias de probabilidade. E aí a pergunta que eu me fazia era, mas se eu estou pensando em formação contraditória, qual que é a diferença da, da, da informação ser contraditória neste sistema CIE, que foi o primeiro artigo que nós publicamos, publiquei em conjunto com Walter Carnelli, saiu na, na Entropy, é... Da, dessa outra abordagem aqui, trabalhando com uma lógica LF1, que é uma lógica que foi desenhada para trabalhar com banco de dados inconsistentes, para essa outra lógica que a gente desenhou com, com um propósito mais específico, que era para tratar da noção de evidência. O quanto que a evidência ela, ela pode impactar né, na... na na validade. Então, a gente tem esses três, essas três lógicas aqui. Tá? Então, a LF1, é, proposta para tratar com informação contraditória dentro de um banco de dados evolucionário, ou seja, eu recebo novas informações e a, a informação pode ser inconsistente. Ela foi desenhada para este propósito. A CI, CIE, é um sistema muito próximo, ela tem quase todas as propriedades da, da lógica clássica, então ela, escolhemos trabalhar com essa por uma questão metodológica, para conseguir obter esses resultados técnicos. Né? E a LETF, que trabalha aí com a noção de evidência e, e o operador de consistência, a bolinha branca, ela é uma forma de recuperar o raciocínio clássico dentro do, do sistema.
só para apresentar mesmo, não vou entrar em detalhe. Bom, que que é, qual é a estratégia que, de trabalho que a gente utilizou para é, extrair essa teoria de probabilidade a partir da, da lógica clássica, a partir de uma lógica, né? Bom, olhando o cenário clássico, o que a gente tem é a teoria de probabilidade de Komogorov, que é, 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 atribui probabilidade em conjuntos de eventos. Se a gente a, a, assume aqui a aditividade finita, o que a gente tem associado é uma álgebra de Boole, para caracterizar essa teoria de probabilidade clássica. Uma outra forma de compreender a teoria de probabilidade é a gente olhar para a, a noção de probabilidade sendo atribuída para sentenças. Então, aqui a gente tem uma relação entre lógica e probabilidade, ou seja, é, a gente atribui probabilidade para sentenças. E neste contexto, a gente define uma semântica probabilística, no caso aqui da lógica clássica, baseada na, na, na lógica clássica proposicional clássica, e aí a gente tem a completude aqui, que fecha esse diagrama no, no contexto clássico. No nosso trabalho, o que, que a gente faz é associar a, a teoria, essa alternativa de probabilidade, a uma lógica não clássica, no caso, a lógica para consistente. E aí a gente define uma semântica probabilística, a diferença é que essa semântica vai ser baseada não na relação de consequência da lógica clássica, mas sim numa outra lógica, que é, no caso, uma lógica para consistente, e a gente consegue demonstrar esse resultado de completude. Então, o nosso trabalho... É, ele fica neste patamar aqui, e aí a, a gente vai explorar um pouco mais uh, o que, o que, que, como é essa nova noção de medida associada a essa lógica diferente. A questão da álgebra, como eu disse, é um problema ainda a ser investigado. Então, tem trabalho ainda pela frente. Então, Quais são os axiomas da lógica de probabilidade, da teoria de probabilidade aqui, baseada numa lógica? Né? Bom, a, os cinco axiomas aqui que a gente trabalha, o primeiro deles, então a gente pega as sentenças da lógica e leva no intervalo 0, 1, né, um conjunto, um número, um número real, as probabilidades, elas de cada sentença, ela varia entre 0 e 1 um, para essas fórmulas. Se uma fórmula ela é teorema da lógica, então agora eu estou teorema da lógica para consistente que eu estou adotando, então a gente atribui probabilidade máxima para esta sentença. Então aqui já tem uma distinção. Né? A lógica para consistente não deriva todos os... Uh, os, os teoremas da lógica clássica. Deriva menos coisa, tem menos axiomas. Se uma, 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 uma sentença ela é um, uma partícula minimal, um bottom, ou uma contradição, então ela recebe probabilidade zero. A comparação, se, se φ deduz ψ, é, se psi deduz φ, então a probabilidade de psi é menor ou igual à probabilidade de φ. E a aditividade finita, como a gente está falando de lógica, lógica a gente tem é, o comprimento da fórmula, ela é finita, então a gente não precisa mais do que é, aditividade finita para falar nesse contexto. Então a gente não precisa de aditividade infinita, que é o que precisaria na, na, na abordagem de Komogorov, né? quando a gente estende isso matematicamente. E aí conceitos é, que aparecem na teoria clássica, a gente pode traduzir é, em termos de, de sentenças. Então, do, do, um, a interseção de dois conjuntos né, ser, ser o vazio, em termos de lógica, a gente diz que duas sentenças são logicamente incompatíveis. Então, quando... 
é o quê? É, as duas em conjunto a, 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 é, se comportam como se fosse uma contradição, um bottom, uma partícula minimal, ou seja, eu trivializo aqui o sistema. Interse entendendo intuitivamente que isso corresponde à interseção vazia. E aí a gente consegue demonstrar os axiomas que essa função de probabilidade que respeita essa, essa nova lógica, o que, que ela satisfaz. Então, o primeiro, o primeiro resultado aqui é bastante é, esperado, que a probabilidade de A ou B é a soma de, da probabilidade de A mais a probabilidade de B, quando A e B são logicamente incompatíveis, ou seja, se a gente imaginar a interseção vazia, Agora, o teorema 2 e 3 são mais interessantes, porque agora aqui a gente tem uma relação do qual é o comportamento da função de probabilidade enquanto relacionada com essa lógica que admite contradição. Então, a, a probabilidade, ou seja, eu vou conseguir medir o quanto uma sentença ela é consistente. Então, a gente consegue medir o grau de consistência de uma sentença. E aí o, a probabilidade, a gente demonstra que é 2 menos probabilidade de A mais a probabilidade de não A. A negação aqui não é clássica, negação para consistente. E aí então, o que, que acontece? Se a, a gente tem uma a probabilidade, a consistência for máxima, ou seja, a, a, forma, a fórmula ela se comporta classicamente, a gente tem o quê? Que a probabilidade de A mais a probabilidade de não A é exatamente 1. 2 menos 1 é 1, ou seja, a probabilidade máxima. Então a gente resgata aqui essa, esse conceito. Mas a soma, como a interseção pode não ser vazia, ou seja, é, a contradição existe, eu admito que em alguns contextos a a e sua negação podem ser verdadeiras, então a gente começa a admitir que a interseção entre A e não A seja não vazia. Tá certo? Tenho a informação contraditória a respeito de A. E aí, então, é, eu fico com uma probabilidade aqui, a soma de A mais a probabilidade de não A excede 1, essa soma. E aí, então, a consistência de A fica menor do que 1. E aí a gente consegue medir o quão consistente é uma fórmula. E aqui a de baixo, probabilidade de A e não A. É... Probabilidade de A mais a probabilidade de não A, menos 1. Porque se eu tiver uma contradição máxima, ou seja, tudo o que eu sei a respeito de A ela é, é, é contraditório, então aí essa soma daria 2 menos 1 aí, a interseção é máxima, ou seja, tem o um máximo de contradição. Então, essas, com esses teoremas, com essas propriedades, a gente consegue, definindo uma relação de consequência baseada nessa noção de probabilidade aí, que respeita esses, esses axiomas, a gente define uma relação de consequência, uma relação de consequência probabilística, né, que gama deduz φ, c e somente c, para toda função de probabilidade que respeitam aqueles axiomas, a gente tem, sempre que a probabilidade das sentenças em gama for igual a 1, então a probabilidade de φ também é igual a 1. Ou seja, na, olhando para os extremos da probabilidade, a, a função ela é uma valoração. É, é isso que a gente demonstra e é isso que expressa o teorema de, de completude. Ou seja... Então, a gente tem aqui, de fato, que a semântica probabilística definida com relação àquela lógica específica, no caso a LF1, que eu estou me referindo, a gente tem é, que ela serve, né, né, entendendo essa probabilidade como valoração, ela é uma valoração da lógica. Então, nesse sentido, a gente tem a completude, e agora a gente pode pensar na relação de consequência da mesma forma, não, 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 não analisamos isso ainda de forma mais detalhada, mas todo o trabalho que o Adams faz com a relação de consequência da lógica clássica, 
é, e trabalhar o conceito de incerteza, transmissão da incerteza da, da, da premissa para a conclusão, poderia ser refeito aqui. Tá? Então, é um trabalho ainda que precisa ser melhor explorado. E aí, agora, a gente vai conseguir explorar um pouco mais o que é essa teoria de probabilidade baseada nessa lógica. Então, os conceitos de independência, né, a gente consegue, como a, a, a definição de probabilidade condicional, ela é toda positiva, então ela é exatamente igual a que se define na, na teoria de probabilidade clássica, o conceito de independência aqui também vai ser igual. A probabilidade de dois eventos são independentes, sem somente ser aqui, a probabilidade de A e B igual o produto das probabilidades. Tá? Então, com esse conceito aqui é, que a gente extrai do, da própria definição de probabilidade condicional, que reescrita aqui em termos lógicos, a gente só troca a interseção pela conjunção. E, e aí, então... Claramente, todas as críticas que se pode fazer a respeito da, da probabilidade condicional que, a gente consegue, que, a gente, que é feita para a probabilidade clássica, aqui nessa teoria para consistente também a gente vai sofrer dos, da, do, da, das mesmas críticas, né? com relação ao que, que é independência, ou a questão de, de ter essa restrição no denominador, ou seja, todo esse debate aqui, é, pode é, é, é readaptado para essa teoria de probabilidade. Okay? Então, agora, para responder a pergunta que eu me fazia, né, qual que é a diferença entre trabalhar com a lógica LF1, KCI e LETF, se tecnicamente, ou seja, quando eu vou demonstrar o resultado de completude, eu não vejo muita diferença. É só uma questão... É, de adaptar as demonstrações, eu consigo o mesmo resultado. Então, a, a, a resposta a essa pergunta, eu fui atrás da aplicação. Eu falei, acho que em termos de aplicação é que eu vou conseguir uma resposta. E, e isso só foi possível depois de explorar mais de um sistema em que a gente consegue demonstrar que o teorema da probabilidade total, que é o que a gente usa para expressar o teorema de Bayes, ele, se apare ele, ele aparece aqui para diferentes lógicas em diferentes formatos. Tá? E isso permite para a gente é, entender, interpretar como que a gente organiza é, de forma diferente né, essas informações contraditórias que pode eventualmente está acontecendo. Então, o primeiro, a primeira divisão que a gente faz é, é abstrair o conceito de partição, que é isso que a gente faz na, quando a gente está trabalhando com uma probabilidade clássica. Eu particiono o, o espaço amostral e aí a gente consegue calcular a probabilidade de um evento B qualquer dentro desta, dessa partição aí, ou seja, levando o, o, em consideração o quanto que B é, é, compartilha de informação com, com um pedaço da partição com, a outro, com outro pedaço da partição. Então aqui a gente vai trabalhar com uma noção mais relaxada de partição, que a gente está chamando de clivagem, e aí a clivagem só vai ser uma partição se ela for exaustiva e exclusiva. Então, o que é ser exaustiva e o que é ser exclusiva? Então, aqui, a partição, a gente tem dois conjuntos aqui, separando a informação A e não A. E ela, ela é exaustiva se vale que A ou não A é teorema e que, de uma contradição, a gente deriva, uh, trivializa o sistema. Então, quando isso acontece, a gente está diante de uma partição. Mas, como na, na clivagem, a gente admite o quê? Que a interseção de A e não A pode ser vazia. É, pode ser não vazia. Eu tenho informação, você tem, eu, a partição sobra aí algum resíduo de, de, de ruído aí de informação contraditória. E aí, então, 
vale o seguinte, ela é exaustiva, mas não precisa ser exclusiva. Então, nesse caso, a gente diz que a, que a partição, na verdade, é uma clivagem. A gente tem, é, permite aí essa, essa contradição. Bom, só adiantando aqui uma possível crítica, né? É, a pessoa fala assim, ah, mas eu não preciso de clivagem, porque é só imaginar o espaço amostral dividido em três conjuntos diferentes e eu restauro aí o raciocínio clássico. Verdade. Só que a diferença aqui é que eu não estou falando de objetos distintos, eu estou falando, por exemplo, de informação a respeito de um mesmo objeto. Então, essa, é, essa contradição, a gente tá, tem que é, levar em consideração em que trata-se do mesmo objeto. Então, eu tenho que entender isso. Então, existe uma relação direta né, dessa, dessas contradições com A e com, a, com, a, com as informações afirmando A e as negando A, por exemplo. Então, essa faz uma, uma diferença. Então, no caso aqui do teorema da probabilidade total, a gente demonstra, no caso da lógica LF1, que é essa que eu estou apresentando aqui, duas versões diferentes do, do teorema da probabilidade total. Que, ao invés de ficar lendo essa definição, eu vou mostrar o esquema de como que ela funciona. Então, aqui, a probabilidade de, de B é, a probabilidade de B, levando em consideração o quanto ele intercepta o conjunto A, a somado com a quantidade, a, a, o quanto ele intercepta a, a, a parte não A, e o quanto ele intercepta, subtraindo aqui a parte que tem contradição. Bola preta aqui indica A e não A. Tá certo? E a segunda, a segunda versão do teorema é que a gente particiona aqui, levando em consideração aquelas informações que são consistentes, ou seja, que não têm contradição, daquelas que têm contradição. Então, a diferença que eu interpreto aqui do teorema da probabilidade é, total, total aqui na versão 1 e na versão 2 é a forma com que eu estou organizando as informações. Então, eu estou imaginando aqui que as informações, né, o conjunto de informações sobre A, alfa, é, eu posso, tô, tudo aquilo que afirma alfa, eu coloco aqui nesse conjunto, tudo que eu nego alfa, eu coloco neste conjunto, sem nenhuma contradição. Agora, aquelas informações que aparecem é, com contradição, eu separo nesse bloco aqui. Então, eu organizei de forma, é, dessa maneira. A outra maneira de organizar é tudo aquilo que não tem contradição, seja com negação ou sem negação, é, a respeito de alfa, eu jogo neste conjunto aqui. Agora, todas aquelas informações que, que se contradizem, separo nesse, outra, nesse outro conjunto. Ou seja, então, a forma como eu escolho organizar os dados vai determinar para mim a forma como eu calculo. E aí aqui, uma vez que os dados já estão organizados, aqui a, a, o, o meu raciocínio é clássico, né? Aqui um é o complemento do outro. E aí então a gente consegue ter diferentes versões do teorema de Bayes. O teorema de Bayes clássico ele é formulado dessa forma aqui. No denominador da fórmula é que aparece o, pro, o teorema da probabilidade total. Aqui, a, a maneira como eu calculo a probabilidade de B, de beta. Né? E, e aí, então, eu tenho a versão 1 um do teorema de Bayes e tenho a outra versão aqui é, associada ao outro teorema da probabilidade total. Ou seja, a maneira como eu escolho organizar os dados é que vai interferir aqui na forma de trabalhar o, a aplicação. E aí a forma de, de, de né, a ideia do teorema de Bayes é aquela, é a mesma, né, de calcular a probabilidade reversa. Né? Preciso calcular a probabilidade de é, alfa ser consistente dado beta, 
eu calculo a probabilidade de beta, dado que alfa é consistente, multiplicado por essa probabilidade, dividido pela probabilidade de B aqui. Tá? Então, é, tecnicamente é só, tendo aquelas informações, a gente consegue é, trabalhar. Bom, no caso daquelas três lógicas que eu, que eu mencionei no início, que foram as que a gente trabalhou. A lógica C e E, a gente demonstrou apenas uma versão do teorema de Bayes, que é a, a, a versão 2, do, a versão 1 um que, que foi mostrada. Na lógica Let F, que é uma lógica que trabalha com, com a ideia de que a informação ela pode ser excessiva e pode ser, é, ter falta de informação, a gente trabalha com uma lógica que que mapeia essa forma de raciocínio em conjunto, ela abre espaço para a gente ter seis formas diferentes de organizar os dados. Então, a gente aparece aqui seis versões do, do teorema de Bayes para trabalhar nesse, nessa outra lógica. Então, para mim, essa foi uma, uma grande surpresa e... E o que mostra que a gente consegue trabalhar a informação contraditória né, de diferentes formas e dependendo do contexto, né, eu posso usar uma lógica ou outra se eu quero refinar esse tratamento da, da informação. Então, é isso que a gente percebe. Agora eu vou mostrar aqui um, um exemplo em que a gente pode estar tá aplicando essa essa teoria de probabilidade para consistente num problema de filtro de spam para consistente. Então, qual que é a ideia aqui? O... Para eu construir esse filtro de spam, eu vou analisar as características de uma mensagem, o corpo da mensagem, e aí, então, vão... o, o filtro vai indicar que aquela, que aquela mensagem ela é um spam ou não, dependendo das características que são suspeitas dentro da mensagem. Por exemplo, né, o código HTML, o, as cores, o, as palavras que são utilizadas na, no corpo da mensagem, isso pode ser um indicativo de ser um spam ou não. E aí, então, quando a gente está trabalhando, a gente separa em dois grupos, tem aquelas características que são suspeitas, mas existem também aquelas características que são duvidosas, que pode cair nos dois grupos. Então, por exemplo, palavras suspeitas, né? É, sexo, compra, dinheiro, o, o link associado, são características que vão acusar, né? Posso estar pensando que a mensagem de fato ela seja um spam. Duvidosa, palavras como livre, agora, são palavras que podem ser usadas tanto num tipo de mensagem como em outro. Então, isso daqui é que vai ser a causa, né, na hora de eu automatizar esse tipo de raciocínio, produzir informações contraditórias. Uma mesma mensagem, dependendo da forma como eu estou ah, avaliando, filtrando essas mensagens ou classificando essas mensagens, eu posso ter que em uma delas, 30% de todas as mensagens é, são vistas, são entendidas como spam, mas um outro filtro pode dizer que 85% não, não era spam. Então, quando a gente confronta essas duas informações vindas de, de filtros diferentes, vamos chamar assim, a gente percebe que as informações não se, não se encontram. Eu tenho ali excesso de informação, ou seja, algumas mensagens num filtro vai ser considerada como sendo spam e no outro não. A pergunta é, é spam ou não é? Né? Bom, a gente vai trabalhar com essas com essas informações. Então, aqui é uma, uma, uma forma de entender a contradição. Então, agora a gente tem a, as informações, né, a probabilidade de ter aquelas características, dado que é um spam, e ter aquelas mesmas características que a gente listou anteriormente, 
dado que não é um spam. Isso daqui a gente pode conseguir essa informação com uma série histórica, fazendo uma análise ali, e aí a gente tem um cenário em que, se eu me insistir em, em trabalhar com essas duas fontes aí, em que os dados se, contradiz, é, se contradizem, a gente tem um cenário em que as informações são dadas dessa forma. Por exemplo, probabilidade de ter as características suspeitas lá, dado que é spam de 90%, é, ter as características suspeitas, dado que não é spam, em 20% das mensagens, e a probabilidade de ter característica suspeita, dado que ela é, é contraditória aqui, né? essa informação 0,01 aqui. Tenho essas informações. Com base nisso, a gente vai aplicar a, o teorema de Bayes é, para consistente, e aí a gente consegue calcular a probabilidade de que um e-mail é spam, dado que ele contém aquelas características. A gente vai, monta aqui o, o, o diagrama, distribui as informações, e aí a gente calcula e isso é, acusa aí que é, tem 61,6% de chance. Bom, até aí tudo bem, uma questão de cálculo. A pergunta, mas o que, que quer dizer esse 61,6%? Isso é bom, isso é ruim? O que, que eu tenho com relação, se eu comparar com o cenário clássico? Né? Então, só faz... Então, a gente separou as informações, ou seja, vamos imaginar este cenário aqui, onde a gente vai eliminar essa contradição. Eu posso eliminar de diferentes, três formas aqui, pelo menos, né? Eu posso entender que eu tinha excesso, é, o excesso estava con concentrado aqui nas informações que não eram spam, tá? Ou então, no contrário, na, na que era spam. Então, eu tiro só ou de um pedaço ou de outro. E aí, também posso pensar que estava metade errado aqui e metade errado aqui. Então, eliminei a contradição e recalculei o, é, o resultado, né, a probabilidade de ser spam, dado que tinha aquelas características, para os três cenários. E aí, o que, que a gente observa é que a gente tem, de fato um resultado diferente, aqui a probabilidade da, usando a teoria de probabilidade para consistente deu 61,6%, que é um valor que está aí bastante próximo dos três cenários, no caso aqui ficou mais entre o primeiro e o segundo cenário, mas o importante é que ele é diferente e não, e não é maluco, Eu acho que isso que é interessante. E por que, que isso faz sentido? É, eliminar a contradição, tirar a contradição de, um, do, de uma massa de dados, isso pode representar um custo alto. Né? Pode ser um custo de tempo, um custo é, de dinheiro mesmo, não sei. Mas isso, isso tem um custo. E aqui o que a gente está mostrando é a gente consegue raciocinar mesmo com a contradição. E, essa, e, a, e esse raciocínio pode ser é, realizado e, e não dá um valor estranho. Ou seja, para a tomada de decisão, de repente isso daqui é, é uma via, se eu não tenho muito tempo para poder ficar é, eliminando a contradição. Que lógico que a gente imagina, se tem contradição, se eu analisar um, um pouco mais de, de detalhamento, eu vou conseguir saber se essa informação está tá correta ou, tá, ou não. E a gente trabalha em lógica para consistente com a ideia de que a, a, a contradição ela é informativa. Numa investigação policial, por exemplo, é, quando duas testemunhas se contradizem, é ali que a investigação vai cair, recair. Eu vou olhar mais atentamente para este cenário, 
do que para outros casos. Então, a, a informação ela, ela é informativa e aqui a gente está mostrando que, ainda por cima, a gente consegue trabalhar com, com ela sem, sem nenhum problema. Tá? Então, o que a gente, só concluindo aqui, o que a gente consegue é ampliar essa análise é, clássica com relação a essa nova teoria de probabilidade. O, o, o filtro de a teoria de análise para consistente ela se mostra bastante cautelosa, né? no, no sentido em que ela prefere, ela, ela tendeu mais a achar que aquela informação não era spam, estou mais próxima deste cenário do que do outro. Essa é uma questão que a gente poderia é, analisar mais atentamente. Então, a gente tem pelo menos três teorias de probabilidade para consistente diferentes, que a gente, aquelas que eu mencionei, e cada uma delas a gente trabalha com versões distintas aí do teorema de, de probabilidade total, o que permite para nós versões diferentes do, do teorema de Bayes, ou seja, a maneira como eu escolho separar, é, organizar os dados, isso é, permite uma análise assim ou assado, né? ou seja, dado... É, Ai, por que, que eu voltei? Tá. Então, aqui, então, só para terminar, então a gente tem aí que, dependendo da lógica, de fato a gente tem uma. Um, a gente pode extrair uma, uma, uma nova teoria da medida. Né? No caso da lógica. LF1, a gente teve aí uma lógica com, com duas versões do, do teorema de Bayes, o que abre aí a discussão, né, qual, qual seria né, o impacto de, dessa análise aí, dessa, que abre caminho para uma nova estatística, em que agora a gente pode pensar numa estatística que leva em consideração que a informação ela pode ser contraditória e se eu penso numa na filosofia da estatística em num, numa posição é, no subjetiva né num bayesianismo a gente tem aí é, como fazer esse update levando em consideração as informações contraditórias então aí a gente abre aí um espaço grande para o debate dentro da própria filosofia da ciência. Isso ainda é trabalho que a gente precisa investigar com mais detalhe quais seriam os impactos disso na, na própria filosofia da ciência. Bom, é isso que eu tinha para falar para vocês hoje. Obrigada. Obrigada por... Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I wish to ask you about the possibility of using this uh, in order to describe correlations. And specifically, if uh, you have uh, true random variables, which are not compatible in the sense that you cannot find a joint probability distribution in the classical way, if you have studied that problem from the point of view of paraconsistent uh, logic? Uh, I, I have no uh, uh, investigated this point, but uh, if I have two um, uh, event, in the independent events, uh, I don't. I, I think this is classical analysis because I I, I don't have uh, contradiction 
in, in this context, I think. But uh, I have not. I I I haven't. I don't analyze this this problem yet. But uh, I think. But if they are not independent. But and not ah. Uh, there is no joint. The problem is like, for example, in quantum mechanics, you have position and momentum, mm. and they are not independent because uh, I don't know they are connected by uh, okay. Heisenberg inequality. So you, <laughs> if something happened to this, you see. Yes. But but uh, but uh, but in a sense, they are not independent. But mm -hmm. but there is no joint probability distribution, at least no joint classical probability distribution. So have you tried to model a situation like that using paraconsistent logic? I, I don't know if I, 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 have, I have no example. I didn't s s thought about that. But, my, but if, I, if I have a context where a contradiction in these scenarios can appear, but I, I, I don't know how. I, I can imagine uh, this context. I, I have no familiarity with, with uh, quantum mechanics. But what I, I have is that uh, paraconsistent logic is used to, to describe uh, uh, can can be used uh, to describe quantum phenomena in sense that the entanglement principle can be reproduced and you can define a, a paraconsistent uh, Turing machine where uh, algorit uh, quantum algorithm algorithms can be performed in, 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 with this logic. But uh, I, I'm not a specialist. Walter can, can talk more about, about, about that. I don't know. <laughs> it's your I paper. I can and cannot. <laughs> <laughs> OK, if you have a question, uh, actually, for the first time, I think that per consistent probabilities are very promising for uh, quantum phenomena, but we really do not know. What I have done with a student of mine was to propose an idea of a, a different kind of a Turing machine. Uh, I mean, just taking the theory of a Turing machine and using a, an S, a part of consistent logic as an underlying logic. Then we can model superpositions, not exactly entanglement, but more superposition, and can show that any quantum algorithm can run in this kind of machine. But it's just a theoretical model. Of course, I, I did not build a quantum computer yet. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, the, the, the algebraic uh, analysis need to, to, to be studied yet. I, I like so much your your models because uh, maybe we can represent the, the, the contradiction in such a model, but I, I don't know, I'm just, just thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Então, é, eu queria fazer uma pergunta que eu acho que é um pouco mais é, sobre lógica. É, Existem algum, alguns casos, alguns exemplos de casos limite em que a escolha de, uma determinada, de um determinado tipo de lógica seja difícil? Difícil em que sentido? No sentido de que... Porque você disse que o criticismo é um instrumento de escolha de, da, da lógica que a gente vai usar, da lógica que vai ser aplicada. E aí eu queria saber se existe algum caso limite em que torne difícil você escolher uma determinada lógica. Ah, eu acredito que 
é, existam lógicas que são igualmente, possa existir lógicas que são igualmente boas para aquele para um determinado problema e que aí a escolha fique, é, sei lá, uma questão de gosto. Eu acho que isso é possível. Eu acho que é, separar, eu acho que não, não é algo que eu vá, eu vá conseguir fazer isso sempre. Porque a forma como é, a gente define né, uma lógica embora eu vá falar eu vou tratar do, do mesmo do mesmo contexto e aí eu vou usar duas lógicas diferentes é, eu acredito no, que possa haver empate eu, essa é a minha, a minha aposta assim mas não tem nenhuma nada assim que uma teoria da decisão né que eu possa decidir escolher entre essa ou aquela eu acho que até onde eu saiba não eu acho que é mais uma questão de familiaridade ah, eu prefiro é, desenhar a lógica usando o método axiomático, porque eu gosto mais. Ah, eu prefiro expressar a lógica por um cálculo de sequentes, embora eu possa mostrar que são equivalentes, né? mas a forma com que a, a gente escolhe, às vezes, depende muito do propósito. Ah, na computação, às vezes, é muito mais vantajoso a gente apresentar a lógica por meio de um cálculo de tableau. Porque a gente consegue é, fazer mais, é, é, compreender de forma mais natural, por exemplo, a relação daquilo com o programa, com o desenho de um programa. Então, assim, eu acho que o critério é mais uma questão de uso e de gosto. E eu acho que, como a gente consegue é, definir sistemas que são equivalentes, né? eu saio de uma, de uma abordagem para outra, então não, não vejo por que, que eu não possa ter, num limite, dois sistemas que vão ser igualmente bons, e aí a, a, a escolha vai ficar mesmo a critério do pesquisador. Assim, eu gosto dessa, acho que essa é mais... conversa melhor comigo nesta linguagem do que na outra. Nesse sentido, não sei se, se, se foi, foi essa a pergunta. Tá? Thank you. Um, so I'm mostly working off the slides here. My knowledge of Portuguese is about the probability of a contradiction or so. So it was very, very small. So apologies if you answered this um, in the spoken part. Um, I'm trying to think about, so I understand that in a pair of consistent logic, if we have that A and not A are not inconsistent, then you might want their probability to add up to one. But you also have in the probability models you're working with, an explicit proposition inside the model that says that A and not A are consistent or that says that they're inconsistent. I would normally think of that as a logical fact. Usually it's a logical fact whether two propositions are consistent or so. And so usually in a probability model, all the logical facts, right, get one or false, logical falsehoods get zero, right? Um, So I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand how to interpret the probabilities, the non-extreme probabilities you want to assign to facts about whether certain sentences are consistent or not. So maybe you could, and, and I'm sure you mentioned some different applications along the way of the pair consistent logic. So maybe in some of the applications, I could understand that more easily than in the others. But if you could talk about that, that would be helpful, please. Uh, I don't know if I understood very well your question uh, about uh, the probability. Uh, uh, in terms of completeness, I think that uh, I, I, I assume that the probabilities uh, receive maximal value in terms of uh, uh, consequence relation. But uh, when I'm doing the calculation, I, I use uh, probability with l less than one. Is, 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 is that your question? 
So you have that thing that is the little open circle and then alpha, right? Uh -huh. And the little open circle says that alpha is consistent and then the closed circle says that alpha is inconsistent, if right? If, yes, right. if alpha is consistent, means that alpha uh, behaves classically. Right. Good. In the sense that the intersection right. between alpha and negation of alpha is zero right. and the alpha... Uh, right. or negation of alpha is maximum. Yeah. So what does it mean to say that there is a 0.5 probability that alpha behaves classically? That's that's the part I'm not uh, understanding. I, I, I interpret this that the, the intersection of the... the uh, I, I think I, I need to, to have two informations. Probability of alpha is 0 0.5, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 0.6, and negation 0 0.2. Mm -hmm. Both together, 0 0.8. Right. Okay? Uh, this means that I have a uh, lack of information about alpha. Okay. Um, uh, uh, there are misinformation in this context. Uh -huh. And okay. if the probability exceeds one, means that I have intersection, uh, or, or, which means uh, the, the proposition uh, is, is, uh, contradict some information, contradict each other in this, in this sense. But in LFI1, uh, I think that the, we can have uh, intersection uh, between uh, contradictory information. But in the other logic, I can reason it with lack of information also. Got it. But I need distinct right. logic for that. So when you were talking about abundance of information, sometimes we have so much information that it starts to contradict itself, and that's when that value goes above one, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah again. <laughs> right. Maybe I can, I can just add one point. The novelty of this approach is that Contradiction, the measure of contradiction is detected by the external world. It's not dictated by internal logic uh, properties, like a uh, classical contradiction is the same as uh, consistent. I mean, classical consistency is the same of lack of contradiction, but not here. I mean, no, here we have two different sources. One is logical, A and not A, and another comes from outside the world. So it's how the, world, the model is behaving itself, how the information is contradicting each other or mixing or, or lacking or how you, let, you have uh, guts or ga gaps, guts or gaps of information, all right? So uh, thank you, Professor Julian again. <laughs> so our next speaker, and the last of today is Professor Benjamin Levinstein. We will talk about accuracy, change, and difference. Benjamin Levinstein is a philosopher from the uh, University of Illinois Champaign, and he works mainly with epistemic utility theory, decision theory, and social epistemology. So thank you, Ben, for coming. And well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I wanted to talk uh, today about chance and credence. So when you know, uh, when you learn things about what the objective chance is, like the chance of heads, and how that should affect what you think about whether a coin will land heads. Uh, so chance is interesting because it has sort of this dual nature. Right? On the one hand, it is there's a metaphysical element to chance. Chance is just a feature of the world independently of what we think. It's something somehow or other based on the nature of physics or reality or whatever that determines what the chance function at that world is. Uh, but it also has this epistemic role where we're supposed to listen to it, right? It's supposed to guide us in what we think. And these can't really be cleanly separate. Right? I mean, why should you... We want to listen to chance some way. If you learn the chance, normally it seems, if you learn that the objective chance of a coin landing heads is 50%, right? normally you should have credence 0.5. You should personally be 50% confident 
that the coin will land will land heads. Uh, but why should you listen to chance? The answer has to be something based on the metaphysics of chance, right? So if I just if a metaphysician said, uh, well, chance just is whatever my friend uh, Belinda thinks about chance, whatever she thinks, right? That's a, that's chance, her credence function. She is is just the chance function. Um, she has no special epistemic access to anything. There'd be no reason to listen, right? Just there has to be some good reason that you want to pay attention uh, to the chance function that'll guide how you, based on this metaphysics, how you defer to it. So uh, I'll focus for a large extent on David Lewis's view, because uh, he carved out both an epi uh, epistemological role for chance and gave an underlying metaphysical account of chance as well that kind of was meant to somehow vindicate this epistemic principle. So he called this the epistemic role the principal principle, and the idea was roughly, uh, given that if you learn the chance of heads is 50%, right, have credence 0.5. If you learn it's 60%, have credence 0.6. And the way he did that, uh, he, said this was, this, he said this was called the principal principle because it's really the only thing we know about chance is that it has to play this epistemic role. And he gave a, this best systems account of laws that was meant to vindicate this role. Right? So he gave a metaphysics of what it was to be a law of nature, what it was to be the chance function at a world that was meant to uh, give you reason to follow the principal principle. And so, uh, unfortunately, though, the Lewis's own view famously, at least his original view, doesn't work. And we'll get into the details, but the main problem is that chances can be modest. So chances can be unsure uh, that they are the chance function. The chance function of this world might be unsure that it's in fact the chance function. And that, well, either renders the principal principle inconsistent or trivial. I think inconsistent is probably the natural way to interpret it. So uh, I want to propose a new principle as a kind of there's the right epistemic role, and I don't want to give you too much of a metaphysics because this is meant, I think, from my point of view as an epistemologist, mostly as something that metaphysics should vindicate. And this came initially, uh, this comes both from a uh, formal result that I, I have should be stated somewhere on your handout, and uh, was inspired, though, different both in motivation and substance by uh, a principle that Kevin Doris came up with in a different context. So uh, roughly, and it'll be stated better later on, uh, given that we got we weaken the principal principle from if you learn that the chance of heads is 0.5, have credence 0.5, to if you learn that the chance of heads is at least 0.5, have credence at least 0.5. And the uh, result is that you'll obey this trust principle some caveats and everything, if and only if you expect chance to be at least as accurate as you are on every reasonable measure of accuracy and for every proposition. So the picture I want to have here is that whatever your metaphysics is of chance, it should be such that a rational agent will have to think that chance will be at least as good as she is on every proposition, no matter how you slice the pie, however you measure accuracy. And if she does, then she'll obey trust. And I think if your metaphysics can't vindicate that idea that she should think that chance is at least as accurate, then it's not a good metaphysics. Uh, the principle, if you do obey trust, has some good advantages, I think. Uh, it will require chance to be, you know, in some sense, a good guide to the world that's you know, built into the accuracy condition. Uh, it'll permit, but not require, modesty from chances. So if you like something that's kind of like Lewis's account of chance, then it's okay that the chances will be modest, but if you have some other account, it's fine too, or they, or they aren't modest. Uh, it will tell us how to defer to chance when chance is modest. And so uh, there's this new principle, which I'll talk about later on, from Hall and Thau that was meant to, Ned Hall and uh, I think Michael Thau, that was meant to correct the 
uh, problem with the principal principle. The problem, though, is that uh, well, there are a bunch of problems with that. One is that it doesn't tell you how to just listen to the regular chances. It tells you how to listen to the chances when they're fed information, like the fact that they're the chances. Uh, so it'll, the trust principle will entail the new principle, but uh, it'll also just tell you how to listen to regular chance. And I haven't quite settled exactly on the formulation I like, so I'll say that um, the, it'll entail something like the principal principle when the chances are immodest, when they're sure they're the chance function. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about accuracy. I'm not going to go, I have more detail on your, your handout, some, uh, some requirements I have on what you need for accuracy. Um, here I just kind of want to give the basic intuition. Not every way you could possibly measure it is one I want, but the basic idea with accuracy is that, um, you know, the higher your credences and trues, the lower your credences and falsehoods, the more accurate you are. So if you have, if I have credence, uh, 70 percent. I'm 70 percent confident it'll rain tomorrow. You're 90 percent confident it'll rain tomorrow. Then, if it actually rains, you're more accurate than I. If it actually doesn't rain, uh, then I'm more accurate than you. Right. Uh, there are lots of different ways you could measure accuracy. Right? They look very different. So here are two popular ones. Uh, the first is the Breyer score. So with the Breyer score, you take every you know, proposition in the algebra and you consider what is your credence in the, that proposition and was the proposition actually true or false. So have W of X be 1 if it's true, be 0 if it's false. So then, uh, so let's say I have credence 0.7 and uh, in X, let that have be rain, W, X will be let's say it does rain, it'll be 1. So then 1 minus uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.3 squared is 0 0.09. And then you kind of add that up for each proposition and subtract it from 1. Right? So if you have perfect accuracy, you'll get a score of 1 because your credence will always match the truth value. Uh, if you're perfectly accurate at every proposition. If you're perfectly inaccurate, right, you have credence 0 when it's true, credence 1 when it's false, then it'll be 1 minus uh, n for however many propositions there are. Uh, so just, you know, squared Euclidean distance, right? The log score is, uh, you, you know, you take something more like just the uh, traditional log measure of information. It's a little different. Uh, but as you can see, that's going to be very different from the Breyer score. Right? Um, there are a bunch of other ones, infinitely many ways of doing this. And you can think of them as all encoding kind of some different way of understanding proximity to the truth. How close are your credences to the truth value? So if you want, you want a, a few more, I actually have a couple other very technical requirements and continuity and limit requirements that I didn't put on there, but you can see what's um, a few other on the handout. Okay. Now, um, the accuracy considerations have been used to justify a bunch of different norms in um, epistemology, such as the idea that your credences should obey the laws of probability theory, at least finitely additive probability, uh, that you should update by conditionalization, uh, and there have actually been arguments even for the regular principle principle, uh, though that's going to be quite different from how I'm going to argue for that today. Um, so I'm going to assume all these, all these additional restrictions that I've alluded to are going to hold. You need them for these arguments as well. And I'm going to say that any measure of accuracy that meets these conditions is standard. All right. So you can use accuracy, this idea of how close you are to the truth, to think about how good or how well off people are, how, whether people are better than you or worse than you or who's better than who epistemically at a world, right? Um, so here's like kind of originally how the Breyer score came to be. The Breyer score was invented by a meteorologist, or I don't know, he published it in a meteorology journal, and uh, it was meant to evaluate weather forecasters. Right? So you'd say, um, how, uh, who's the better weather forecaster? Well, what you could do is, you know, maybe take a year, 
see what the forecasts were, you know, whether it actually rained or snowed or whatever, take their Breyer scores and see who got a better Breyer score for that year, right? So you could might say that Alice is Bob's superior if she got a better Breyer score. Uh, a problem, though, is that, you know, there are different rules, and they're going to disagree about who's superior, right? So uh, here's a randomly generated example from Python um, that where the Breyer score will say here, so I'm um, sorry, Suppose there are four balls in an urn, we'll get a little vignette going, uh, A, B, C, and D, and that A is the actual one chosen. Right. So here's Alice's credences that you know, A, B, C, or D will be chosen, and Bob's. If uh, A is chosen, then the Breyer score will say that Alice is doing better, that she's, she got a, she's overall better off than Bob. The log score will say that Bob is better. Right, so this notion of superiority isn't that good, and you can kind of see it's kind of hard to tell who's more accurate, right? Um, this notion of superiority is kind of a little too weak because it only works for one, one scoring rule at a time. There's not, they'll get different orders for different people. The, uh, but, you know, it's not like this will, you can always rig it up this way, right? So if you have Carol here as well, Carol will be more accurate no matter what the rule is. And, you know, this is clearly just designed based on the fact that, you know, A was chosen. Well, Carol has a more accurate credence in A than both Alice and Bob. She's got a more accurate credence in B, since B is false, and, more, and in C, and in D, right? So this will get you a partial order um, where you will have some people who are kind of absolutely better off, absolutely more accurate than others, no matter how you slice the pie. Right, so we might try this really strong notion, Alice is superior if she's more accurate according to every standard measure. Now, I think that's actually uh, a little too strong, and it's too strong at least for what we want, because what won't matter really for us, right, we're trying to think of how you should listen to chance. It won't matter whether chance is actually, in the end, more accurate than you all the time, what matters is whether how you should listen to chance. So it matters how you should what you should personally think about chance. Right. So the notion that we're going to want uh, will be something like this, right? So I think my weather forecaster, at least on weather propositions, uh, will be is kind of an absolute superior to me. No matter what standard rule I use, I should expect the weather forecaster to be better. Right. I expect the weather forecaster's credence to be more accurate than my own, at least before I learn what uh, she has to say. But there could be some day, right, so occasionally I'll end up just kind of maybe by luck or something being more accurate, right? So I suppose before I learn what she thinks, I have, I'm 50% confident in rain. Turns out she was 80% confident in rain. Well, that was one of the days where it didn't rain, right? So my original credence of 0.5 was more accurate than her credence of 0.8, right? But I still, I would have expected her to beat me, and right, most days she, she would. So the notion that I'm interested in then is this one that allows sometimes for you to, you know, you might end up better than your weather forecaster for that day. You might end up better than uh, chance for that day. But you should think that we'll have this, this notion of absolute superiority based on expectation. So Bob will take Alice to be an absolute superior if he expects that she is more accurate than he is on every single rule. And I guess I'm sort of ambiguous here. You can take that locally or globally. Uh, really what will end up, it will kind of collapse, but you'd think is an absolute superior if he expects that she's more accurate than he is on every standard measure and for every proposition. So uh, just kind of, if you're wondering, you can see what's, uh, think about something like the principal principle, which I haven't stated. Exactly, but I've alluded to is this idea, right, that if you learn chance, the principal principle says if you learn chance is, if heads is 70%, you should just have credence 0.7. If you learn it's 80%, you should have credence 0.8, and so on, um, at least in normal circumstances. And uh, that turns out to be sufficient for thinking someone's this absolute superior. So if you are going to defer to someone like this, then it's sufficient to think that she's at least as accurate as you are in every, every standard measure. 
but it's not necessary. All right. So that was the quick you know, accuracy primer. I want to talk about the Lewisian account and see how uh, what what goes wrong with it. So, right, he thought, well, the first thing we can do is we know what basically what chance's epistemic role is. Right? You should listen to chance. And so he had uh, this principle principle, which you see a lot of different formulations of, but uh, one way of stating it is if C is the rational credence function and e, is C's, uh, e along with C's total evidence are admissible with respect to the chance function, then uh, your credence in X, given that the chance of, in this proposition is X, and E will be X. So E, we have to put a little bit of restrictions on what E can be, right? Because E can't be X. Like you can't have that your credence in heads, given that the chance of heads is 50%, and actually heads, right? You can't have credence 0.5 then, you'd have credence 1. So you need to restrict that, but normally chance is just going to kind of screen off all your evidence, all your other evidence. So the idea is like, for most types of evidence, doesn't matter what else you know, if you know chance, you just know there's no chance. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about admissibility, something I probably need to think a bit more about, but one way of capturing it that's safe is to say that E is admissible for the chance function if it's just independent of X, right, according to chance. So chance doesn't think E matters. All right. So uh, the principle of principle, it's very intuitive, right? It got its name based on um, Lewis thinking this was the primary thing about chance. But there's a question like, why, what is it about chance, this objective thing in the world that makes it so that you should obey the principle of principle? Why is this one probability function other than truth so good that if you learn what it is, you should just give up your own thoughts and just listen to what chance has to say. So, right, so a bad answer is this thing that doesn't really explain it, right? You could say, well, that's what the chance rule is. Um, but I think the better answer is like, you have to give some metaphysical story that says what about chance makes it so special, right? Like if I can tell you why chance is something about chance and why something gets to be called the chance function from a metaphysical perspective, then, uh, and that just makes it the case that chance is going to be really accurate or something, then maybe that's a way of vindicating the principle principle. And that's how I see Lewis's metaphysical account of laws doing. So uh, the Lewisian account has, so we'll start with uh, deterministic laws. So suppose we're kind of ignoring chance for a minute. What does it take for Lewis for something like Maxwell's equations to count as the laws, right? It's not just enough that they're true. Um, there has to be a bit more as well, right? Because something like uh, there are lots of true things that don't count as laws of nature, right? Like I have a, a cup of water here. That's not a law, even though it's a truth. Right, so what makes it that Maxwell counts as laws, but um, the other, but the fact that I have a cup in front of me is not a law. And so Lewis thought, well, the rough idea was that the laws are something like the best system of nature, the best systems account of nature. They're really good at codifying how things work uh, and capturing the regularity. So he said, well, there, here are two things that really are, are good for being a law. You want the laws to be simple, and there are some nuances there, but roughly you can think of it as, as it doesn't take too long to state the laws, right? Like we can write down the laws of quantum mechanics. We can write down quantum mechanics pretty quickly. Um, we can write down thermodynamical laws pretty quickly. We can write down Maxwell's equations pretty quickly. I, it's, it takes much longer for me to write down everything that's true, even just about this room, right? So I can't write down like there are this many chairs, this is the color, there are this many people, you know, it's a, like these are, that's way too complicated. I couldn't capture all the true facts very easily. So that would not be very simple. So you want your laws to be simple, but you also want them to be strong, 
right? So the tauto a tautology is very simple, but that's true of every world. So you don't really want tautologies to count as laws. You want your laws to rule out a lot of alternative possibilities. So you want simplicity and you want strength. And the laws are, in this deterministic setting, are the set of statements that somehow strike the optimal balance between them, which is kind of hard to understand what that means. But uh, you want things like Maxwell's equations, right? Those are pretty simple. They're also really strong. So they do pretty well. So the idea you could think of is every, every candidate set of laws gets a score. Uh, it has to be true. But then it gets a score based on whether it's simple, on the simplicity, how simple is it, how strong is it. And based on these scores, we you know, somehow perform some balancing act. And that determines what the laws are. There's true generalizations that are do the best of this. Uh, now, sometimes though, you can also get you can really increase simplicity uh, by introducing indeterminism. So you lose a bit by way of strength potentially, but you uh, gain you gain a lot. So you could imagine just take a really of toy type of world where it's just a coin being flipped a bunch of times. Um, in a deterministic case, there might if there's no simple pattern to the outcomes of heads and tails, there might not be too much to say, right? That's simple and strong. It's just like, well, there were three heads and then there were two tails. And, you know, it would be, there's nothing really simple and strong to say. But if you introduce a probability, you can say a lot, right? Very quickly. If you say something like the chance that there's a probability of 0.5 that it'll land heads every time, and they're independent. Very quick to state that, tells you a lot, and so you gain something in your loss. So that was the motivation for introducing these probabilities, right? You can say a lot more really quickly, very simply, if you introduce these probabilities. But how do you determine what the right probability is? And Lewis introduced this virtue called fitness. So uh, the fitness of a chance function or of a candidate chance function, is the probability that it assigns to the actual world. Because the official way that Lewis has it. So whatever, you know, the, the um, so in some ways, right, the probability function that assigns probability one to the actual world has the highest fit, but you can't really say that very well. That's going to be a really complicated function. So uh, you lower that, you still want a good amount of fit, and chance says, uh, you know, is based on how, high of a probability assigns to the actual world. So right now we have strength, simplicity, and fit competing against each other. But because we care a lot about fit, you know, you have to fill in a bit on what optimal balance means. But presumably if you fill that in the right way, it seems like you're on the path to something like the principal principle, right? Why should you listen to chance? Because it's baked into what chance is that it has a high degree of fit. And maybe if you think, well, I don't know, maybe strength and simplicity can, something does really well in strength and simplicity that, over, that compensates for a low fitness score, so I bet I can beat chance. Lewis can just kind of, for all he said, because he's remained pretty vague, rule that out based on some kind of consideration like, well, no, that's, doesn't, that's not what strike the optimal balance is, right? You can always tune the parameter of fitness high enough that rationally you're going to expect chance to beat you. All right. Um, so I actually think that, I think this is a friendly amendment. Uh, I think that Lewis is wrong to use fit as the way it was officially glossed. I don't think he's going to get anything like the principal principle from that. And instead, I'm going to say the fitness of a candidate chance function is just its accuracy. And the reason that I, I think that uh, the fit won't work is that Fit only looks at one proposition, right? It only looks at what you assign to the actual world, not to what you assign to say, there will be at least seven heads on the coin flips, right? Uh, that hap that's true of a lot of different worlds. So fit just looks at literally how high was the prop probability in the actual world. And we care about other propositions too, right? And the idea is principle principle tells us to listen to chance about every proposition. So what you're going to want is something like the overall accuracy, not just the accuracy of this one proposition and how likely is the actual world. 
So I'm going to count that now as kind of the starred Lewisian account where we have strength, simplicity, and accuracy. Uh, that will render some candidate chance functions incomparable for fit, but it won't really matter for what else I want to say. Okay, so you can sort of see the story, right? We tune the parameter so that chance has to be really accurate, um, modulo simplicity and strength. If you insist enough on that accuracy, then it seems like something like the principal principle should come out because it's just guaranteed by the metaphysics of chance that it'll be really accurate. The problem, though, is that this very metaphysics then makes, undermines the principal principle. So uh, here's an example I think is basically Lewis's. So suppose P is the chance function of the actual world. And uh, P will say of any given tritium atom, at, least at the right time, let's say, that it will, there's a 50% chance that that atom will decay within 12.32 years. Right? That's the actual half-life of tritium. So if I had two tritium atoms and I said, well, what's the probability that neither, that, uh, neither will decay within 12.32 years, right? They're not causally related or anything. They're just kind of two random tritium atoms. The probability according to P would be 0.5, right? What about uh, that three of them, take three random ones that no three will decay, uh, those three won't decay within 12.32 years. That'll be uh, one over eight and so on. So uh, we'll have A be the proposition that no tritium atom will decay within its half-life actual half-life. Well, P will assign A a positive probability, right? If there are n tritium atoms, then it'll assign a probability 1 over 2 to the n. But imagine that A were actually true. If A were true, then P would be pretty inaccurate, right? There'd be another function that was way, bet that was way more accurate. At the world where no tritium atom decays in 12.32 years, there's a way better function that says that tritium atoms have a much longer half-life, right? So at the world where no tritium atom decays within 12.32 years, P is not the chance function of that world. But P assigns that world positive probability, right? It assigns the probability one over two to the n. So according to P, the probability that P is the chance function is less than one. P is unsure that it's the chance function. All right. But then you have the problem, right? So by the principal principle, uh, love, I'm just going to abbreviate P is the chance function with CH sub P. Uh, credence that P is the chance function, given P is the chance function, is the probability that P assigns to the claim that it's the chance function. Uh, but by the laws of probability that it has to be one, right? So if P assigns probability less than one to the fact that it's a chance function, then we get a contradiction. So uh, Ned Hall and uh, Michael Thau uh, came up with a way of correcting this. And that was with uh, the new principle, which also goes under a different, bunch of different formulations. Uh, but it's, you can see it's kind of ugly. Uh, so your credence in a proposition, given the chance of the proposition is x and p is the chance function, uh, will be is x is x. So you can kind of gloss this one, feed the chance function all your evidence that you have, and also uh, let it know that it's the chance function. And then listen to it after you do all that. Right? So if we feed P the proposition, the fact that it's the chance function, then it'll give then give A zero probability. Because it knows that it's not a chance function at that world, so it will assign A zero probability there. So uh, it's kind of ugly, but I'll call the, the idea here that... Uh, when you listen, when you feed, let the chances know, you bring them up to speed on the fact that they are the chances. So you let P know that it's the chances. I'll call that the chances plus. 
right? So uh, the new principle basically says, instead of listening to the regular chances, listen to the chances plus. Now, uh, there's a problem here because I think one thing that's weird is, you know, the chances uh, are modest. This now doesn't really tell us much about how to just listen to the regular chances. It just tells us um, how to listen to the chances plus. And so maybe, you know, you think that's fine. But uh, I think there are a lot of reasons that you shouldn't yet be satisfied. So one reason is um, we often know a lot more about the chances than the chances plus, and we calculate the chances, right? Like we'll calculate, we can calculate the chance of A. We don't necessarily know the chance plus of A. Um, so we usually use the chances in these scientific calculations. The chances are faithful, more faithful to causal structure, right? Like the tritium atoms are all independent. There's no causal relationship between them, or there need not be. And so it's weird that they now are probabilistically dependent on the chances plus, right? Conditional on like uh, more than half of them taking over 12.32 years. That's going to give you some information about the, what the rest are going to do. So uh, the chances plus have these weird dependencies. The chances are kind of limiting the causal structure of the world. And the chances are what are playing a role in laws. So uh, I think we want something that tells us more than just the new principle principle, the new principle. And so uh, there are a few different principles I've played around with. I'm only going to talk about two. I added at least one more on your handout. Um, so first we'll say, we'll weaken the total deference to this thing of simple trust. So say C simply trust chance. If C's credence in X, given that the chance of X is at least X, is always at least X. So um, just to kind of get around how this works, notice that then if, because uh, we have an algebra of propositions, this will also mean that if you learn the chance is less than or equal to X, it'll be less than or equal to X. Because if X is a proposition, so is not X. And uh, at least in the finite case, you can also just replace it with a straight up strict inequality if you wanted to. However, uh, it doesn't collapse, right? So if you learn that it's greater than or equal to x and less than or equal to x, that doesn't mean your credence should be x. And the reason that it, you don't then just have credence x is because uh, just think more generally about what I'm telling you. If I tell you, if you learn E as your total evidence, do, you know, have credence whatever. If you learn F and F as your total evidence, have some other credence. If you have learned both E and F, so E and F as your total evidence, I haven't, you don't know, right? Like I haven't told you what to do. So here I have, if you're, uh, if you learn that the chance is less than or equal to X, I tell you what to do. If I tell you it's greater than or equal to X, I tell you what to do. If you learn both, I haven't, I don't give you any advice. Okay, so uh, you can prove that uh, C will simply trust chance if and only if C expects chance to be an absolute epistemic superior for every proposition, right? So C will expect chance to be at least as accurate on all reasonable measures of accuracy, or at least what I call good measures of accuracy, for all propositions. And equality will hold only if C is sure that C of X is the chance. So you can see, I think, a slightly more careful statement of the theorem on your, on your handout. So the idea is that, right, um, your best systems account, if you're kind of, or if you want chance to play the chance role, your metaphysical view should make it so that it's kind of rationally obligatory at least to simply trust chance. Right. Uh, in the sense that you should build it into chance that you should think that chance is going to be more accurate than you are. Like if your metaphysics doesn't somehow justify that, then you've given a bad metaphysics. But I think we can actually strengthen 
this a bit to what we'll call the simple trust, I'm sorry, from simple trust to trust. And uh, what this says is that as long as chance, whenever, no matter, it's not just that you trust chance now, given what you currently know, but no matter what you would learn, if chance knows at least that much, so if your total evidence is E and chance at least knows E2, you should keep on trusting, simply trusting chance, right? So it's not just like currently I simply trust chance, um, but if I learn E, then I'm not going to pay any more attention to chance. This, uh, the trust principle will say that if you learn E, as long as chance will also know E, then uh, you should have credence at least X. So the idea is like, no matter what I learn, chance is always going to be, I'm always going to keep expecting chance to be at least as accurate as I am on each proposition. Uh, so I'm going to say a little bit more about why I think, you know, you should have that, it's something that strong. But I will say, you know, there's some nice features of the trust principle. Uh, most of the, a lot of, some of these come from uh, Dorse paper. So uh, one thing is the trust principle will entail the new principle. Right? But it's not entailed by it. So it tells you a bit more about how to get, listen to chance than the new principle principle, the new principle does. And it also entails a version, at least, depending on how it's formulated of the principle principle, when chance is immodest. So it answers, uh, in some way, question one, right? Why listen to chance? Why should you listen to chance? Did you listen to chance? Because you expect it to be really accurate, at least better than you are. And the second question, uh, how to listen to chance when chance is modest, right? Which the new principle does not tell us. So um, I've been you know, talking about, about Lewis, but I kind of want to emphasize the idea is not that I want to be wedded to a Lewisian account metaphysically, but that I think that you can use it as a test case. So in the paper, I go through a few other types uh, of, or a few other types of views about what chance is, what metaphysically makes some function the chance function. And I think as a test case, you can use this at least as an adequacy condition. Right? So if you're not able to argue that rational agents should be obliged to think so highly of chance, then your metaphysics isn't very good. I think in Lewis's case, he's vague enough about what strike the optimal balance is that you could think of it instead as something like, we're going to persistify what strike the optimal balance is, but whatever you want to say, you can use this as a constraint on this metaphysical question of what makes some probability function the chance function at that world. Um, one reason I think that you should think that this is pretty, pretty reasonable as a constraint, at least if you're inclined to something like the best systems account, is uh, I want to use this terminology from Ned Hall of database expert and analyst expert. So I'll start with what you think of as an analyst expert. So an analyst expert is someone who knows really well how to handle your evidence, right? or knows how to handle evidence really well. So uh, you can get some intuition with this, with the idea that like, you know, if you show me, if I go to the doctor and I get an MRI, this isn't a perfect example, but if I go to the doctor and get an MRI, and you show me that MRI, I will have no idea what to think about whether I have some disease or malady, right? Like it'll just, I'll have no, it won't really be much use to me. The doctor, on the other hand, will know exactly, or I hope, will know what to do with the evidence, right? The actor will be presented with the same evidence, MRI, scan, and then say, like, say, oh, you should have, be like 80% sure that you have, I don't know, whatever malady I don't want. Uh, so an analyst expert is someone who can handle your evidence really well, and a database expert is someone who knows more than you, right? So if I want to know, um, who won the, uh, you know, some game of Brazil's in the, uh, you know, three World Cups ago, uh, I, will, I won't know, right? But if I ask people here, there's a good chance that people just know more than I do, and I would have a much better credence, right? 
I mean, I know like the Germany game, but that was kind of it, right? Um, other than that, I don't know much about how Brazil has done in the World Cup. So in that sense, it's just a database expert. You just have more information than I do. Um, you might think rational agents, people who are rational are in some sense really good analysts, right? They know how to handle their evidence really well according to whatever epistemic laws there are. But they don't have that much information. If you're inclined to something at least like the best systems account, not necessarily Lewis's, but this idea of chance somehow capturing the world really well, the idea is that chance is sort of baked in, that chance is like fitting the actual information about how things turn out in the world well, right? It fits like it's based on something like how accurate it is with respect to every proposition at the world, you know, based, and that somewhat depends even on how things go in the future. And so chance is sort of built to have more information than you. So even if you think chance is an analyst expert, uh, sorry, you think yourself is a really good analyst, chance at least, you know, can be both a, something of a database expert and an analyst expert, at least implicitly, because it's sort of designed around how the world actually turns out. So uh, I think the trust principle is, um, works pretty well. It's a nice intermediate principle. It's not as strong as the principal principle, which is inconsistent when chance is modest, but it's stronger than the new principle. It puts on additional constraints. Uh, I think the accuracy constraints are pretty well, well motivated, at least if you like anything like a best systems account. And I think that the deference principle itself has some nice consequences. So I think it kind of comes as a nice, uh, fairly attractive de deference principle independently in its own right. Um, I don't know if there's anything stronger that would be good. It seems to me about the strongest you're going to get from accuracy considerations alone. Uh, but um, I think it's at least the minimum requirement for adequacy on, on the metaphysics. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Now we have the debate. Who wants to make the first question, please? Yeah, do you always have one? <laughs> A lot of questions. <laughs> so just on the last thing you said about Chance being a database expert, yeah. given that Chance features in our best system, and sometimes in the best system, you sim you sacrifice strength for simplicity. The best system isn't going to contain all the facts about what actually happens in the world. Right. So what if there's a chance event, and I know how it came out, but the chance function doesn't know? Then it feels like the chance function should not act as a database expert for me. And in fact, it feels like maybe I should violate the trust principle because I have more information than the chances do. Uh, yeah, thanks. So this is why I, I've been very curious about how, or I'm still sort of undecided on exactly what I want to uh, endorse. The trust principle um, also you know, is built to bring chance up to speed on your total evidence. Right? Now, simple trust uh, is not. right. Um, so what you might think is that, well, the trust principle in a way then kind of builds in, in too much and it lacks uh, a parallel. So right, so in some way, right, you've already told chance what happened, so it's guaranteed. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about, so on, on the handout, there's a principle, I think I call it the principle trust principle or something, um, that's built to be parallel to the principle principle. Um, where chance, where I think you know, one feature of the principle principle is that people kind of forget about relative to other deference principles. It's not just that you should listen to chance, but you should listen to chance even when you know some other stuff, um, except when that stuff is weird, like how things turned out, right? Um, so I think in that case, what I'd say is there should be this inter nice intermediate principle. Maybe that's the right one to endorse. 
And then I'd say you had inadmissible evidence there. But, yeah. Well, I, I have a general question. <laughs> what does your account on change on chains uh, presuppose about uh, the epistemology of disagreement? Oh, good. Um, well, I don't know how much it says about, um, you mean just pure disagreement? Yeah, the uniqueness thesis or not? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll really plug uh, Kevin Dorse's paper, which is heavily about, uh, I call it, I use the same terminology and, you know, some deference to Dorse, uh, but it's in a very different context for him. Um, and he was really interested in how you should rationally listen to one another. Um, I think, though, it's going to be really hard to say, so I have a view, which is sort of independent from this, which is, from my point of view, it doesn't matter whether uniqueness is true for disagreement. You should generally be conciliatory, um, though not always. Um, if you want to use something like uh, Kevin's framework for uh, pure disagreement, um, well, then I think you can maybe get something out of get something out of this. But uh, I think when you're thinking about chances as something objective, you know, it's not going to immediately have implications for disagreement. Another one, title one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so uh, I think we can finish. So right. thank you again, uh, Professor Benjamin. Thank you.